you have is a rider's eye view of arguably the most intimidating venue in sport, the Bec de Ross. This is the grand finale of the Free Ride World Tour. This is the Extreme Verbier. Woo! Four stops have led us here to the biggest day on the competitive free ride calendar. This is the Extreme Verbier and the best free riders in the world are about to go toe to toe on that intimidating face behind me. I'm very pleased to say joining me to make sense of all of the action today are two bona fide legends in the big mountain world, Lorraine Huber and Xavier De La Rue. Hello. So awesome to be here. Uh, Lorraine, you only retired last year with a second place on this face, I might add. Uh, what's the overriding emotion? Is it relief that you're not competing or is it frustration that you want to be up there? Look, I'm not going to lie, Ed, a part of me is relieved because it's hugely stressful competing on the back. It's a very intimidating, very challenging face. I'm going to tell you also that the riders are partially afraid of it. That's just normal. And so, yeah, and, and the other part of me is just missing the riders a bit, missing being part of that. But on the other hand, I've moved on to other things. And right now, I can't imagine competing here. My head is so far away from it. OK, well, Lorraine spent eight years on the tour. She joined in 2009. And in that time, she took two second places on the Bec de Ross and a third. Uh, she took two wins in Fieberbrunn and she was crowned 2017 Freeride World Tour champion in the women's ski category. And then stood next to Lorraine Xavier de la Rue. You've competed on this face 15 times. That is unprecedented. You know better than anyone what it takes to win here. Well, I know what it takes to win, but I also know what it takes to take a big, big crash because I've had uh, quite a few ones. Nothing and like starting on a positive. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. And uh, if you see under my beanie, I've got a lot of white hair, and that's what it does when you compete here 15 times because even after so many times, you still have so much pressure because it's a mountain of commitment. And, um, yeah, it's... Like, very intimidating, like Lorraine said. That's really, that puts this in perspective. When two riders of your calibre talk about how nervous this face makes you, you competed, as I said here, 15 years. You won three free ride World Tour titles. Mm -hmm. You took four wins on the uh, Bec de Ross. I mean, that's a record only equaled by Steve Klassen, I think. But probably most impressively, you've got a cliff named after you on this face. Yeah, I know. Like... That one year, I, I kind of had the, the thing in me, you know, and we, we always talk about the, the fire that you need to have to send a crazy line. And I think that was my crazy line for sure. And one of the most impressive things for me as well is that the Delarue dynasty could continue this year. Victor, your youngest brother, is competing and he is in the mix for a world title. That's a new emotion for you. This is completely crazy because I never expected to have any of my brothers here. And this year, my little brother decides to come on the tour and he just starts winning and winning. And here he is with a yellow bib. And I must say that I don't know what's more stressful, if it's being at the start or watching the little brother having to launch himself off the big mama. Well, it's the Delarue DNA is in effect today, make no mistake. Uh, we've got a packed show for you. This is how it pans out, nearly three hours of action. We're going to kick off in just a few minutes' time with the women's snowboarding. Then at 9 o'clock, we'll be in with the ski women. And then we've got a mid-show where we'll wrap up and analyse all of the happenings from the women's and move on to the men's. Men's snowboarding kicking off at 10 a.m. and then men's skiing at 10.30 a.m. It promises 
continues to be a uh, very, very interesting day of action. Now, if you don't know where we are, this is Verbier, and we've got a very clever satellite map that's going to draw us in from outer space and right down into this southwestern corner of Switzerland, tucked up between the French and Italian borders, you'll find this idyllic south-facing bowl. It's the largest ski area in Switzerland and tucked away on the south border is this intimidating pile of rocks, as Zav has called it, uh, the Bec de Ross, and it's the, pe the final stop of the Freeride World Tour. But to get here, we have four other stops that have very different personalities and characteristics, and they all test different traits of the riders, don't they? The tour kicks off in Japan, and there, Zav, it's all about the snow. Yeah, Japan is really well known for its huge powder riding into the trees. It's usually bad weather, but it's really playful terrain. And we see on that uh, on that competition that there's a lot of freestyle going on because the terrain is just made for that. So it's a great way into the tour. Yeah, we saw some really playful lines here, Lorraine. Yeah, we did. And I think the riders love the amount of tricks and variability that the venue offered them in Japan. It wasn't the longest face, but the, it was just packed with features. Well, we can see here they had some uh, great runs there. And then it moves on to Kicking Horse in British Columbia. And how would you describe that face? Because it's a real mix, isn't it? I think in Kicking Horse, the riders really need that highlight piece. They need a show piece. It's, it's a very short face. So if you make a mistake on that one move, you're going to have a very difficult time in terms of points. How do you find it, Zav, when you've got a face like that where you've got to make everything count around for one big feature? Well, I think both Lorraine and I, like we, we both come from like big faces, big mountains, where you have time to kind of express yourself. And I've always found it really hard to being able to shine on really small things. So it's always really intense, but at the same time, you can really commit some mistakes because you need to send it some extra mile to, to get the the points and get the, the wow effect in a way because that's what you're looking for. Tour then moves the midpoint to Fieberbrunn. You've won it twice. How does that face line up with all of the others? Is it the first taste of big mountain terrain? Absolutely. Um, the women also started from the very top of the Wildseelode this year and I'm telling you, it's very intimidating up there. It's similar in a way to the Beck, so it gives them that first taste of exposure. You don't want to be falling in that area. And then in the bottom section, you've again got that more playful terrain where you can let your freestyle tricks shine. Okay, Zav, I mean, what do you make of it? You, you've got that mixture and it, it's a first taste of doing something big like Verbier. Yeah, exactly. I think it's pretty good into the, the mix to come up to, to this event here because yeah, the whole top section, you've got all these cliffs at the bottom and it's basically a no-fall zone. So, so it changes the game completely penultimate stop, your home mountain range, the Pyrenees. And that's always quite spontaneous because the face changes each year. Yeah, exactly. The, that's the Pyrenees. It changes really quickly, really fast. It can be amazing sometimes, but it can become um, kind of spring snow. And we've seen some ama amazing lines come down on spring snow. And I think it's always really impressive to see that the riders can adapt themselves to the conditions. And this year has been a really tough uh, event down there, but they, they've They've been throwing some incredible lines. So I think we see the level going up, up, up. And yeah, I'm really stoked to watch them. Well, it's a huge shift from that freestyle up here to Verbier. But one of the things that runs alongside that, if you've got all of those different personalities in the venues, you've got just as much diversity in the athletes themselves. They come from alpine skiing. Some of them grow up free riding now. And then some of them, like Marcus Ida, come from the highest levels of freestyle. So you've got to have a judging system that can reflect all of those different skills on those different faces. So let's take a closer look at the judging categories. It's subjective. It's not about at a time you're judged on five different categories the first of which is line and you can see sam smoothies here from andorra a few years back this is the route that you take down the mountain the more technical the more exposed the more risk that you ex uh, that you expose yourself to then the better it is fluidity is how your line flows how everything links together if you're having to tra do massive traverses across the face to link your features together then you're losing points also if you hesitate anywhere then you've got the first 
consists of two categories where you can get docked points. Control is the first of those. If you're falling, then obviously you're losing points, but uh, small mistakes can really cost you. The judges are looking for excuses. Then you have air and style. This refers to everything that happens when you leave the snow. And this year especially, we've started seeing more and more freestyle entering lines. And then finally, we've got technique, another category where you can really lose points. Xavier De La Rue there uh, on that 2010 line. Uh, and the technique is making it look good in the tightest, riskiest, most technical spots of the face. Uh, now we're just going to take a quick look at the Red Bull TV analyzer. You can join in the conversation using the hashtag Red Bull TV, or you can go onto the analyzer and share some of the best runs that you see being thrown down today. Now though, we're going to take a quick look back at the women's snowboarding. Before we get stuck into the competition, this is how the women's snowboarding season has played out. But Marion right now looking strong. That was a huge error off the top, and she is charging, pouring over the edge. This is looking good right now for Marion Archie. Such a strong run, super fast. That air at the top really kicked things off. The judges love that. My goal this year was to be the winner before Verbier and to make the run of my life in Verbier. Transfers like that one, really nice transfer fan from Annabelle. She's cruising down that technical zone. Storm. Dropping another drop. Manuela Mando making her way down the powder field towards some of the more technical features we've seen. Coming out hot and circulating that powder. Easy to watch with the lady. Well, there's nothing like adding a little bit of pressure into the mix. Marion Hayati, already world champ, has claimed she's going to send it here. Yeah, she has. I mean, to say uh, the run of my life, wow, because <laughs> you're in a competition situation, so there's a lot of those variables and pressure you're dealing with anyway. Um, so it will be really exciting to see her run here today. Yeah, but she's in such a comfortable position. It is exactly the chance to do to throw the, the run of her life. So I'm really looking forward to see that. She had a great smile on her face like in the last few days. So I think we're going to see some cool show. Okay, the confidence is running high with Marion Hayati, definitely one to watch. We can take a quick look now at the face though. This is the Petty Beck. Uh, it's on the looker's right hand side of the Beck Diros. Start two start options around 2,900, 2,990 mark. And then the finish down the bottom there uh, gives you a vertical of between 375 and 365. A little bit more sun on this face. It faces a bit more east. So in the morning it gets a really, really nice light. And Zav, you've said the best snow is on this side. Yeah, usually there's always the best on this side. Uh, right now, I am not sure if, you know, there's been it's been really hot yesterday, so it might uh, have put a little crust. So we're going to see the forerunner this morning, like they came down maybe 20 minutes ago, and they were like, yeah, it's a little bit crusty. But So the, the riders are going to have to adapt because that's what free riding is all about. Same conditions for everyone. Okay, we're going to take a very short break, but when we come back, we have got the women's snowboard category opening up. Buckle yourselves in. This is going to be fantastic.
And that's all it is. If you do that, then I can time it because I can either fill for the Three Eyed World Tour finals. Welcome here. It's good to have you with us. My name is Neil Willerman, and with me, the veteran commentator returning for the final stop of this year, Martin McFly Winkler. How are you doing today? Thanks for having me, Neil. So happy to be back at the finals here on this such a gorgeous day. What a view we have in our office today. Yeah, that's right. The big looking amazing. As we just heard Zev say, though, the snow might be a little bit crusty. So we will see how things unfold during the day. The light is perfect, though. No complaints there. We've had a little bit of bad luck with weather over the last few years. So fantastic to have such a bluebird day and not have to be in a rush at all. Looking forward to seeing the girls kick it off from the lookers right hand side, the ladies Beck, as we call it. And then later on, we're going to have the guys from the top three different starts today. Looking at the snowboard women, we've got seven people competing here today. I think that might actually not be quite right. We've got a long... Oh, that's the ranking. Sorry. Why don't you talk us through the ranking? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we have the, the only category that is already has a world champion decided is Marion Hertie out of France with a second world title. Uh, followed in the overall ranking of Anna Orlova and Manuela Mandel in third. Erika Vikanda in fourth, and then Maria Kuzma out of New Zealand, and Wakanahama and Nicole Kelly following up. Um, some of them didn't make the cut, unfortunately. The ones that we have here competing are already up in the start gate. The snowboard women will kick things off with the action here at the Bac de Ross. That's right. We only have four of the snowboarders that have managed to qualify for the finals here this year and for next year, the 2020 World Tour. Manuela Mandel, last year's World Tour champion, will be first out of the gate. And I think it's going to be really interesting because last year she put down a safe run to cement her overall world title. And this year she cannot win the world title overall, so she might be looking for a win here in Verbier. However, we have Marianne Erti saying she's going to put down the run of her life and uh, it's going to be a really interesting competition between those two and the other two, of course, all capable of winning here today. So very exciting. Manuel Mandel in the Stargate, your country compatriot. Where did you get yeah, going? Yeah, she originally out of uh, Vienna, the capital, where we don't have as many mountains <laughs> as you would think uh, the way uh, Manuela rides. But uh, she uh, changed residence to Innsbruck, where it's definitely more options out of the door to go riding. And that's what you can see here. She is so solid on her snowboard for years now. She uh, knows how to charge and still knows how to play tactics. Today, there are no tactics because she cannot make it to make the, f uh, the title, the overall title. So she is going for the win. That's what she told me. Riding super fast here as well, but maybe clipping a rock just there. It looks like that wasn't exactly what she planned to do. That was pretty quick into the chute, really steep in there. So Manuela Mandel may be coming a little bit unstuck after taking that first hit quite big and coming down to the mandatory now. Stomping that one, looking really clean, smooth and solid. You can see there's a uh, little bit more sun on the face in this part, so it might be a little bit more sun effect. Maybe a little bit crusty there, but look, making light work of it, the Austrian. Yeah, that's uh, her standard technique that she's displaying. Snow looking good. She knows how, where to find the good snow. Going for her last air, no hesitation, perfect stomp. That was amazing. That was a really, really solid run from last year's World Tour champion. And it's not finished. There's no. more features yet to come. You're right. Nice air at the bottom, making it kind of into a double. So many features. That's really cool and impressive. Really, really good stuff from Manuel Amanda, last year's World Tour champion, looking to turn it into a victory on the Vector Ross this year. Uh, it was really cool to see her sending it all season this year. She started things off with a couple of huge airs in her runs in Canada and in Japan, and she's in the finish now. Pumping her arms, she's happy with herself, she's proud of it. First person out of the gate is a really tough thing to do in the World Tour. We see now her line going through the compulsory chute at the top. I think we'll see quite a lot of traffic through that area today. And rolling down into the finish gate now, standing next to the Peeps banner, sponsored by Peeps, one of the safety partners of the Free Ride World Tour. And we're seeing the slow motion replay now. Uh, line, fluidity, air and style and technique, all in the positives. Really great run, but that little bit of a bobble coming out of her first air and maybe clipping a rock has done bad things for her control score. So overall, I think this will be a great run, great score for Manuel Mandel. Really pushing the limits with the women snowboarding this year, and it's proud to see. So 59.66. Even with a control issue near the top, I think that is a great way to start the day for Manu. Still, she knows 
It's going to be tough to take the win here with a mistake like that. She tried it all. Let's see what the other girls come up with. There are only three riders left to go. Four overall here in the women's snowboard category. Erika Vikander coming up next. The 28-year-old former slope star rider out of Portland, Oregon. Out of such, Mount Hood. such a positive and happy character. Always good vibes being around her. That's right. And Erika putting down two podium runs in the last two competitions to grab her spot for the next year's World Tour in 2020 and another competition run here after last year being the first time she qualified for the finals here in Verbia. And look at that view. Bluebird, amazing mountains in the background, starting from one of the two women's starts that we have here today. The start gate being on the lookers right start and the start corral that we stamped out yesterday. She's on course now from that lookers left start following Manu's track so far. Yeah, as you said, same start as Manuel Amandel. Cruising it down through that section. There is definitely over that lip a no-fall zone. Coming down to the mandatory cliff in the middle here. So Manu had already had air by this point, but also a control issue. So Erika, I'll be interested to see how her score compares for that, because she's coming down to the same mandatory air as Manu hit. A little bit more hesitation though. And, and there is a, li a little issue in the landing there. Unfortunately, also a little bit of hesitation. She had to let the slough pass first before she could clear the rocks and uh, have a safe landing. That's um, right. So I think we'll have to see some impressive stuff from her further down in her run here to challenge Manu. Now the little air in the middle section there, finding the good snow. Going for the grab as well. I think snow conditions are for the snowboard Snowboarder is more favorable than for the skiers with that little crust on top, but easy to break through as it seems like. That's right, enjoying the good snow there with that surf influence style or park influence style. Going for a grab there. F nice finish of Erika Vikanda. Yeah, a really strong finish to the run there from Erika. Similar line to Manu. I'll be interested to see how the score compares. A uh, little bit of a control issue at the top as well, and one less air that could be the difference in the end, but we'll let the judges decide that. Two impressive runs from the ladies so far, and a great way to kick things off. Absolutely. Still, both of them, as you mentioned, had a little bubble in their, in their run. Not the way you want to go for a, a win today, but um, you never know. Only four riders to go, and it is a, comp a challenging face, so... Uh, Going for a big run and having no issues is not an easy task. That's right. So some of the scores down here, fluidity, I think, is a punishment for the hesitation that she had above the mandatory cliff. Pretty tough cliff in there. We've seen a lot of people fall on it before, so yeah, uh, wanting to make sure that she did it uh, in the best possible capacity. Erica Vikanda's score coming in now. Giving the crowd a wave. She is looking at a 55, so four and a bit points behind Manu Mandel sitting in second for now. So only four girls starting today. Uh, potential to podium is high, but uh, of course they all want to be taking home the win. So here's someone that can be doing that, Anna Olova out of Russia. Really strong rider out of Russia. She was on the qualifiers for many years, proved that she can play with the big girls. And uh, for three, two seasons already, she is uh, challenging the number one spot. This year, just out of contention, but she was one of the contenders for the third World Tour title for until the last stop here in, uh, in Andorra. Um, now, as all the girls, she's definitely going for the win here in the very prestigious Back de Ross. That's very right. extreme title is on our hands. Yeah, and uh, taking home a win in the first stop in Hakuba this year. So uh, now she has the opportunity to take home another win. And with that, I think she could be sitting second overall in the women's rankings, which would be the highest that she has placed, I believe. So the Russian just about to get on course. She is now right there from the lookers left women's start. And coming over into the central Kuwa, I believe that there was actually a bit of a difference between where Manu and Erika rode. And this is where Manu rode and it is following her tracks off this cliff at the top and taking that top hit to the side, which I think may be a smart choice because she's not picked up as much speed coming out of that and not had a control issue compared to Manu. So big ups to Manu for the charging. Smart line choice from Anna. Impressive show from the ladies all over so far. And that was meant to be a punt on Anna all over. She is ripping it up here today. Nice stomp on that mandatory. Absolutely, that hourglass cliff she took like a boss. 
didn't even wait for the slough to pass. Great stump, taking this one deep. Perfect stump again. She is on a roll. Yeah, it's really impressive when you see someone go past the last person's landing bomb hole. So doing that in a different capacity to the other riders can really make you stand out. And I think so far, this is a pretty solid run for me so far, McFly. I think this will be lit sitting in number one. Oh, yeah, she is lit. on course for a Freeride World Tour finals win if Madame Mario Herti doesn't bring down her run that she is uh, hoping to get. Yeah. All right. So solid run from the Russian and a different variation no, on the double at the bottom. Really cool. And so quite similar runs from the sn three snowboarders that we've had so far. And uh, coming in hot to the finish corral there. I think she's pretty happy with herself as we see a slight difference in the top section and middle section of this one. But she is happy with herself. She's got the GoPro on her head. Captured some great footage today with that sloughy... Uh, sparkly power experience as Derek Foos named it and the first rider we've seen today with all control in the green. Yeah, here we have definitely the biggest feature that she hit on the way down of the little back and uh, she connected all the clips perfectly. Who Not are we going to see new leader here? Big, definitely, 77 points. And, and all over, sitting in first at the moment, McFly. Oh yeah, she is a happy camper. I'm very sure that uh, her good friend Ivan Malakov is watching at home. All the best to you, Ivan, with your knee injury. He will be back next year. But final rider of the season of the snowboard women category is up. And she is already the Freyard World Tour champion of 2019. There is no way that her title can be taken away. But it's all about the Bec de Ross, the extreme Verbier title today. Yeah, that's right. A lot of people say that winning here is just as good as winning the tour overall. And Marion, having already won the tour overall, she said apparently earlier that she is here to put down the run of her life. Sitting pretty in first place, wearing the golden bib, she could become the third lady to win the Bec de Ross twice on a snowboard. So she's on course now, the only lady in the snowboard category starting from the looker's right start. This is where I four ran from yesterday, and it's a lot of fun. Oh, and she's going big already, right out of the start gate. Shutting down speed on that open terrain there. Very smart riding. Really fast, Marion, as well. This is exactly where I rode through 360. yesterday. And a 360 stomping it. Nice one from the freestyle original rider competing in the World Cup in freestyle previously, now having already won the Freyard World Tour this year and in 2017. Solid run we're seeing here. And this is a big cliff she's lining up. This oh, is a huge yeah. nose. Are we going to see her send it as a double, maybe? Little bit of hesitation there, but now she's in the middle of this crazy double section. Yeah, Marion! Wow, what a technical section, and she cleared it perfectly. Not finished yet. She has to bring it down, but that's exactly the round she was looking for, the yeah. round of her life. The French snowboard future legend, current World Tour champion, potential Freeride World Tour finals champion as well. What a solid run from Marinetti, claiming <laughs> it and then putting it down. Wow, that was impressive. Congratulations, Marion Herti. And uh, without further ado, there is no doubt that this is first place. What and like, how much style can you finish a season? Already the <laughs> Golden Bib World Champion. And sorry to take it away already, but that is no doubt. One of the best runs we've seen from the snowboard ladies category ever at the Freeroad World Tour. That was incredible. Look at this top here. So much commitment into the steepest section. Needs to shut it down. I can tell you that snow wasn't that soft there. 360 off this lip. I think that was the same place Anne Floor Marks had tried one a few years ago, but I think that Anne Floor might have crashed. So for a successful stomp, a snowboard lady 360 in that area. And then a little bit of hesitation into this, but you can see why. Super gnarly, technical and exposed. Hands up as soon as she came out of that, claiming it, and you should be. Deserved way to come down and victory lap your season. What a place to do it. What a day in the sun to show off how much of a champion you are and you call it yeah, <laughs> sorry i had to uh, it was so obvious and the judges didn't let me down this time <laughs> 88 points a win in the finals a win overall that means that anna all over is second vacating the hot seat i don't think marion will get to sit in there for long because we're going to be kicking right off with the ski woman category after a short short break
getting hugs from the rest of the category. There you can see it was super solid riding from the ladies today and finished off by the World Tour champion taking a title on the Victor Ross, the third woman to win two times here and I think the first woman to stomp a 360. At the back, I have to go down the, the memory lane, but uh, first of all, we're going to have the third over, overall ranking and what a score that was never seen before in the women's category. Marion Herti with 10,000 points. Yes, yeah, so solid. It must be nearly perfect. Four results counting out of the five competitions. And Marion Herti right up there. And it'll over second with two uh, or even three podiums this year, I believe. Manuel Amandel, the defending champion in third overall, and Erika Vikander in fourth. Uh, as you're saying, Maria Kuzma, Wakana Hama, and Nicole Kelly not, unfortunately, qualifying for next year. But wicked show from the ladies, both today and this whole season. Oh, yeah, what a show we had on our hands. Great snow all over the season. Um, only maybe one stop was uh, holding us back a little bit in on the powder section, but... Uh, even here, we were not expecting to see such a show with those snow conditions, but uh, snow, as we said, uh, looked better than we expected, huh? That's right. Yeah, really good snow today. Uh, better than we expected, actually, since we heard from the forearms a little bit crusty, or maybe the snowballers just made it look good, because that was an impressive <laughs> show to watch. In the finish area, we have Ed Waite, who just did the introductory show before. He is there with some of the riders they've just finished, they've had, as Marianne said, the run of her life. So I bet they're pretty psyched. Over to you, Ed. Tell us how it's doing down there. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Martin. We're here with the woman who has had a perfect season. You just saw it. 10,000 points. Not only four <laughs> wins to count for those 10,000 points, but you've just laid down that line. That, that's huge, Marion. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, you. You said beforehand that this was your plan. You wanted to have the world title sewn up before you came here so that you had the freedom to lay down a line like that. W was that the line you wanted? Um... Yeah, I would like to have a better 36, but I'm super stoked to win today and everything is perfect. The ambience, the sand, the snow. Oh, I mean, the snow was not good at the top, but I'm happy. That's it. <laughs> it. There's a lot of pressure, but it feels to me like your confidence has been really high this year. Uh, I'm more confident, but I can be still in stress for sure. And today I was so in stress because this is the back there us and you have to be really focused. So I need a little bit to be in stress to be ready focus on what I want to do. And I mean, Zav, you said that that cliff in the middle of the line there, that, that was a lot of exposure there. Yeah, totally. Like getting in there, I was like, okay, what does she have in her mind? I know <laughs> it's the, the run of your life. And uh, what, what are you going to do in there? And you pulled it off really well. Oh, and adding a 360 and bringing that mix into the game so was happy. really refreshing, really cool to watch. Merci. And uh, I mean, for you now, where do you go from here? Four wins on the tour and then you've taken out this. Uh, what are you going to push for? What are you looking for next year? I think I can do it better for sure. I can be better on my broad. So I want to push myself because I really love snowboarding and I want to continue for sure. <laughs> okay, Marion, no. thank you so much. Sorry, Zav, you were going to say? No, no, I would say that's a great answer because it's not about winning. It's about just pushing the yeah. sport and you're doing it right now. Yeah, so it's good. Keep passion. going. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, well, what we have got quickly is the uh, line tracker. We can take a quick look at your line there, Marion. So you can talk us through it. Uh, raw motion the graphics company have put together a little bit of the line you you were the only rider to take off on the snowboarders left hand side star what was your decision behind that uh, because for me it was the best line for gems and but for sure the, the snow was a little bit shitty on the top but i'm from the slope style and for me to ride the icy snow it's okay i don't care <laughs> okay, well, you can see all of the uh, lines there. It was a beautiful line, and it puts a full stop on an incredible season for Marianne Hayati. Uh, we're going to take a quick break now, but when we come back, we've got the skiing women.
Welcome back. We're about to get the ski women's category underway. Lorraine, it's been arguably one of the most progressive this year. It's such a new category this year. Um, a lot of change has gone on with the riders themselves. And whereas uh, even just only last year, Ed, Ari would have been the only girl who you can expect to see doing a trick. Now it's like two, three girls throwing down tricks. I feel like there's a lot of fresh uh, air in the category and it's really exciting to watch. Okay, well, we can take a look at how the season's played out for the ski women now. I call it out, a 360 to start things off. Right off the middle of that one, in the bomb hole, but no problem for her. Stomping is clean, Ari is such a solid skier. I know that if I'm having fun, then I ski pretty well. I keep it simple. Uh, that's what I did the past years, and I already had a title, so I think it's a good philosophy. Bull bit, Jackie making no meal of it, just sending it straight down across court. Jackie yeah, taking it huge. With the double. Rookie year, what I really wanted to do was, you know, show people that I was able to ski and have fun and qualify for this event. So getting here was definitely um, the most important thing for me. Backflip out of the no game. No surprise! Yeah, <laughs> oh, thinking. Focus, well, also being relaxed and fun. Stomping that air, too. Oh, around the other side. Super creative line there. Navarro Sin. Jackie taking it deep. A yeah. little bit of a back slap, but stomping it from the American. Absolutely massive. Well, it is an incredibly high-pressure situation that faces both Jacqueline Pollard and Ariana Tricomi now. You've been in this situation before, haven't you, Lorraine? Yeah, in 2014, Nadine Valina and I were really close in points, and basically we knew that whoever was going to win here in Verbier would be world champion, and that is a difficult situation to be in. If you think much too much about the title and the points and the results, you just stop focusing on the job that you actually have to do which is skiing the line that you've chosen so I'm um, yeah I'm curious to see how the girls will deal with that today and it's a really different set of personalities and circumstance Xavier in the Jacqueline Pollard is the rookie on tour and Ariana defending champion a lot more pressure it feels like or a lot more expectation at least for Ariana yeah, but at the same time, you know, with that scenario, I think it's kind of ideal, I would say, because they know they just have to send it. There's no trying to, you know, stay on your feet because you need to just get a few points. You need to win to get the title. They know it, so they're just going to give everything. So in a way, it's kind of easy because in the head, it's just press the on button and go. And I think we're going to see some cool riding. Okay, we're going to hand over to Neil uh, Williman and Martin Winkler now to press the on button. All right, we are about to press the on button here for the ladies ski on the ladies beck. The ladies beck being the lookers right hand side of the beck where we have two start gates for the ladies and we're going to have three start gates from the guy for the lookers left side, the main face. Uh, Martin McFly, you were just asking about the stats for this one and uh, if Ari wins, she wins overall. If Jacqueline wins, she wins overall. Otherwise, Ari has to lose by two places to Jacqueline for the World Tour title to be handed over to the rookie. How do you think about that? What a showdown we have on our hands. If one of the two girls win, they're going to take the title, not only at the Verbi Extreme, but the overall title. So it is on for those two girls. Imagine how nervous will they be? Yeah, and Hedwig Vessel not far behind them either, sitting in third place. Really impressive runs and big backflips from the Norwegian ride, wild carded onto the tour this year and showing why she deserves to be here. Elizabeth Gerritsen sitting in fourth at the moment, the local rider out of Switzerland. Uh, got something to prove on a home mountain here, maybe? Oh, definitely. Uh, further on, we have Jacqueline Passo, the veteran out of US of A, and uh, Hazel Birnbaum finishing things off for the women's today. That's right, Hazel Birnbaum, she is starting the field off today. She only just got her skis last night, so good oh, yeah. to have her back on those. Fresh from the airport, thanks guys. Elizabeth Gerritsen's next, and Jacqueline Pollard, Hedwig Vessel coming in fourth. Jacqueline Passo winning the last stop and reconsidering her potential retirement, I believe. Ariana Tricomi, the defending World Tour champ, rounding out the star list. Yeah, it's only over when the lady sings. <laughs> <laughs> Hazel Van Baum on her last stop ever, her swan song, as she called it this morning. She is about to get things started for the ladies skiing on the Beck de Ross, the ladies' Beck, and it is her last run on the Freeride World Tour. She is retiring after today. 
Yeah, that is a strong word, retirement. Of course, it's only retirement of the highest level of competing. She will be a skier for all of her life and definitely has some projects in her bag for the future to come. But That's now right. she course. is off and she's always good for some surprises, some main action happening. She has been showing some amazing doubles here before on the left and on the right side of the back. So what has she got on for us to serve? Storming off that top cliff that Manu Mandel and Anna Oliver both hit and then coming straight into the compulsory air and taking it off the bigger part so fast out of here into the sunnier aspect which might be cr uh, crustier snow so really impressive skiing really strong from the american on her last run on the free ride world tour coming over to a big double as well what she got for us down the bottom here continuing into that zone with huge cliffs beautiful takeoff there stomping it clean again what a run from hazel yet so fast Lead to steal. No options left to do any features yet there where she's right now, but opening the throttle all the way to the finish line. Yeah, just what too fast. <laughs> what <laughs> too an opening quick. line for the ski women category. So impressive. What a last line to finish your Fred World Tour career with. As you said, she's not retiring from skiing. She's retiring from competitive free riding. And she could become the first woman to win twice on the Beck on skis. No lady has ever done that before, but we've got three ladies with an opportunity to do it here today. She's the first one of them. Hazel Birnbaum looking at her line now. Really creative and getting through lots of features there. Yeah, she ticked all the boxes. She uh, actually is very surprising. Usually you see the, the girls continuing in the fall line. She just changed a little bit and got into another gnarly zone and that opened up her score point, her bank account of scores. So strong. All of the judging criteria lines right up in the green there. I think we're going to see a high score. Always tough for the judges when the first rider skis so well because you don't know how much room you need to leave in what areas above and below them because, of course, the judging, the points are just a ranking system. It is not an exact science. So 80 points for Hazel Burnbound. That's the judges saying they're not sure if they're going to see definitely runs that are better than that today. It's really, really high points to start things off with in the women's skiing category, and I think she could be looking at a podium. Big gear since there's five riders still to come, but super strong ride from the American rider. Oh, yeah, whatever happens today, she is happy with her run for sure. Big smile for the party tonight, whether it's first place or whatever podium it will be. Next up, the Swiss local, Elizabeth Gerritsen, the young gun, 23 years old, and uh, she is smart. The young gun already proves that she is kind of skiing like a veteran, uh, but still has uh, all the fresh and creative creativity in her yeah, mind. Yeah, good line choices as well. Yeah. Really cool to see her put a bit of style in there. That, as you're saying, the young local said that she was very, very nervous about this competition, especially, and asked her why at the opening ceremony on stage last night. And she said, because it's the only one her mum is watching live. Oh, yeah, that's always a tricky one. You don't want to scare your family, especially not your mum. And uh, it is an intimidating face for everyone, the one competitors and, of course, the one who are riding. So just seeing a shot of the judges there, getting the, their forms together, ready to pencil in the scores of the second rider here, Elizabeth Gerritsen, the local out of Verbier, and she is on course. Heading left, same as Hazel Burnbaum so far. We'll see if she takes the same cliff. Oh, and yeah, she, does. she goes big on that first cliff. So fast. Holy moly, shuts down speed perfectly. Will she take another big step there? She does. What? Oh my gosh, that was so massive. She's on the tracks of Pia Nick Gunderson. She took that cliff at the same spot. But what an opening. Like, this is mental. Yeah, nice way to hit that cliff as well. Setting herself perfectly up for this next air, which she takes so deep. So deep. <laughs> oh, my gosh, Elizabeth. And you're straight lighting out the body. You're turning that roller into air as well. The local rider didn't look nervous during her run. That was incredible stuff from the young Swiss oh, lady. Oh, oh, I've goosebumps, man, all over. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> Holy Amazing. crap. Amazing. And oh, she's so hard on herself, usually. And uh, that... My mind, like in my mind, she's always holding herself a little back because she's not having the confidence. But this showed not like this run. thousand percent confidence. Yeah. That was skiing at her full potential. That was just absolutely ripping stuff, taking all of those airs as deep as she wanted to go. That's really long and oh, past the next bomb holes of other people. So impressive to see. Check that one out. That is with so much exposure. Oh my god, and then shutting down the speed to get another huge air into that open shoot where then she can open up the throttle. Boom. 
Wow, that Legs is so impressive. Of steel from the young Swiss rider. <laughs> and arms out doing the Jesus claim on her way to the finish line. And why not? You deserve it. That was an incredible run. I said about Hazel before that she, she could be looking at a podium with such a strong run already. But already you have the next rider overtaking it with 85 points. We've seen an 80 and an 85 in the first two ladies. And Elizabeth <laughs> can't believe it. One of the highest scores that we've seen in a while. And already vacating the hot seat after such a strong run from Hazel Elizabeth. Have a seat, grab a Red Bull. You might be there for a little while. Oh my God. Yeah, let's continue the show with one of the title contenders today, Jacqueline Pollard, the rookie, 21 years of age, out of US of A. Out of the Utah. So if she wins, she wins. Not just today, but overall. In her first ever season, she could take home a world title here today. If she doesn't win, it's no longer up to her, it's up to Ari and what Ari does in her run. So I'm sure that Ari will be very interested to see what happens for the young American rider in her run. I wonder if she'll adjust accordingly. But first, and most importantly, let's see the American on course starting from the lookers left start and heading straight over to the cool walk compulsory zone. Yeah, we've seen already all the ski ladies going over there. That's the best opening start you can have. Taking that first air way smaller than that. We have to compare it to her to the Current number one, the leading in the hot seat. Creative Miss. stuff here though, hitting all the way lookers left, getting into the good snow above a really big cliff. And is she gonna send this off the nose? Cause holy damn, it is a big one. Pointing it through the chute and airing out the bottom, looking so controlled, great technique from this young lady. No hesitation, that's super steep and technical in there. Unfortunately, not a huge cliff so far, but technical riding and she's adding a big cliff at the yeah, bottom here. Yeah, that was a really nice one. Very solid riding. You don't see any hesitation or nerv nervousness. Is that the right word? Yeah, that is exactly the right <laughs> word that she has none of. Really cool creative run, completely different to the rest of the ladies there. Same bottom cliff, same top cliff, completely different all the way in between. So impressive stuff to, to pick a completely different line on your first time on the ladies' back. And big ups to you, Jacqueline Pollard. And just imagine, 21 years of age, not as much freeride world tour experience like none of the elite experience except w the one season she has on her on her hands she must have uh, qualified pretty pretty early coming from the juniors and yeah, then that's right. into the qualies yeah winning the junior tour as well uh, qualifying uh, one of one of her first years and the attempts and then all of those lines are in the green but i would say not as high as we saw from some of the other girls these lines of course just indicated to help translate the writing into the score you can see what things she's done well as and what things she's comparatively done not as well but uh line up there judges obviously liking that it shows something different so we'll see how that translates into the score if she wins ari cannot retain her title as a fred will to a champion if she doesn't it's up to ari so where's the score gonna be mcfly um i have it in my mind and uh, it was just like i thought uh, what a strong run from Jacqueline Pollard, don't get me wrong, but we have seen like some insane runs, especially of this girl here in the hot seat. She cannot believe it herself, to be honest. As we said, she's always so hard on herself, she was like, probably not expecting and to now, be in the hot seat. But an she interview is. with Ed Lee, talking to the most recent competitor here, Jacqueline Pollard. Jackie, your first time on the back, Diros. Did it live up to expectations? <laughs> a lot more exciting and fun than I thought it was going to be. It was so sick to be up there with these ladies and you know I'm proud to have put down a run and I'm proud of this lady. I hope she can hold on to it. You found some unique line out the side there with fresh tracks. Oh, I know. I, you know, when I got here this is just such a impressive kind of intimidating face and you know I wanted to just have fun with it and so I kind of thought you know looks like I could get a pretty good power turn out there and you know that's what I did. And I, I heard a rumor that you've been, uh, you were weaned on this face in your free ride development process. You were shown this by coaches yeah, and they said, this is the pinnacle of the sport. It was, you know, one day I hoped maybe I could get here and you know, being on here today, it really lived up to my expectations. A nervous wait now to watch Harry drop though. Oh uh, no, you know, I'm so excited. I hope she stomps it. She's been such a fun rider to be around and I wish her all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great words from the young American rider. Really positive. I saw you smiling when she said, I oh, just wanted a good power turn out the look at the left side of the yep. face. You enjoy that, McFly? Absolutely. What a sportswoman. And we have another one on our hands, uh, Hedvig Vessel out of Norway, the power woman. 
living currently in Lausanne, very close to Verbier here. And uh, she has something special in her mind, I know, and she has proven to be a very spectacular and, yeah, action-loaded rider all over the, the free world world to this season. Yeah, that's right. It's a go big or go home has pretty much been her motto. It's been really <laughs> impressive to watch. The George Rodney of women skiing. <laughs> Absolutely. She has a mogul background like not any. She was an Olympian and uh, really performing on the highest level in moguls. And uh, there she uh, transferred the backflip that we have seen a couple of times already. But this time it's a pure big mountain venue leading or following kind of the tracks of Jacqueline Pollard, the previous rider. But she has some other things in her mind going over to the far skier's right, complete fresh tracks, and I know she's going to head for a really big feature. She's Have a look at... She's exposure here too. Ooh, no, she just missed because of really bad snow conditions. You can see the tails hooking. There is a big crust in there that made her miss one of the big features she was aiming for, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately because of the crust. It could have been really bad because this feature that she was planning on was huge. Yeah, she held it together really well there. As you said, crusty snow and a little, little bit difficult to see where it is crusty, but solid air out the bottom, sending that one, showing her composure and strength as a competitive skier. Took home a win in Austria this year at the Feb run stop. Probably not going to be a win with that run today, but big ups to the strength and technique to hold it together in exposure when the crusty snow caught her skis. So a bit of a shrug, shrug claim as she comes through the gate. Haven't really seen any crashes today, from uh, especially not from the woman skiing. A little bit of uh, control issue on a couple of the snowboard women, but uh, so far really solid stuff. Uh, it's the first issue we've seen in the crusty snow and still kept her on her feet in the exposure. So strong skiing from all of the ladies. Absolutely, what a level we have on our hands this today of the ski ladies. And uh, here we uh, we just miss. Uh, the one time where she uh, had some issues, but a uh, beautiful cliff at the bottom in here, technical skiing, no hesitation. But of course, a little bumped that she could not perform on this big feature that she was planning on. Still a solid run, and currently sitting in 61 points. Uh, above 50, even with a control issue above a cliff, which the judges usually get a bit scared by, it can hurt the score. So uh, it's an impressive stuff that with the rest of her cliff, she managed to bump up her score that high. Uh, well done from Hedvig. Been super great to have you this year. Look forward to seeing you next year. But is this going to be the last time we see Jackie Paso? She was talking about retiring. Maybe she's not now. Took a win in the last stop in Andorra. The 36-year-old who has won here in Verbier before. And excited to see what she's got for us today. Oh, yeah. She is all or nothing, lady. Go big or go home fits best to her mentality. And uh, she's uh, proven on her what she says last season, last year on the Freud World Tour, and uh, arguably the last run of her competitive career we see now. Could be, could be not. The one thing I am certain about is that if she wins today, she'll be the first lady to win twice on the back. She won here in 2016. She's got a chance to do that this year in 2019. Taking that top air really solidly and really great technique to shut that speed down because saw other people struggle with that a little bit. Coming into this mandatory that she's hit before and stomping that one super Sending solid. Sending it deep. But unfortunately, get uh, if I sit, saw it right, she got pushed back into the back seat. Got high-sided on that crusty snow, maybe. Yeah. And she couldn't resist the pressure to shut down the speed in control. Unfortunately, a crash of Jackie Paso, which definitely yeah, will not make her challenge the hot seat of Elizabeth Gerritsen currently. Yeah, I'm really sorry to see that. Big fan of Jackie and her skiing. Sending it big. If you didn't see her run in Andorra, then go check it out because she went massive. Uh, she's always down to send it. This time ended up skiing into some crusty snow on her way to the next feature. I can tell you that anything that is a bit more east facing has had a bit of sun and a bit of freeze thaw. So uh, the snow is not quite as good in those areas and getting the best of Jack V. Paso, unfortunately, today. But still big ups. It's been pretty busy for her uh, back to Sweden between now and the last stop. So uh, a lot of traveling. And uh, coming back here to the back after that may be a little bit difficult, but still, solid stuff from the American veteran. Absolutely. Like, what a way, a style to finish her season off. This Maybe part. her career. Yeah. And look at this here. She is sending it deep and stomping it clean. And 
that's here when things got wrong a little bit. Here we have the control issue in the red, unfortunately, because of her pushed back into the yeah, back seat and crashed. Yeah, sorry to see that, Jackie. Big ups for sending it. Good to see you still got a smile on your face. <laughs> With a nice. Uh, so much spoiler. GoPro snow. Yeah, GoPro <laughs> snow. <laughs> spoiler, yeah. <laughs> so 35 points for Jackie Paso, putting her in fifth at the moment. That means that the last person in the start gate today is Ari Tricomi. And very interesting, it looks like she is about to start from the lookers right. The only person in the women's skiing that start from that start, and the same as in the women's snowboarding, we only saw the defending champ or the 2017 champ starting from the start. So can she do what Marion Atty did? Put down an impressive run from the only person to start from the start gate. If she does, she will take the title. Basically, if she crashes, then I think the World Tour overall will get handed to Jacqueline Pollard. So super interested to see what happens from this point. Uh, if she wins, she wins. If she places two places or even one place above Jacqueline Pollard, then she will win. So really interesting stuff. I'm pretty sure that's the maths. It's a little bit more complicated than that, probably. But I'd be stoked to see her standing on the podium. And I'm pretty sure that she doesn't do the math. She wants to show and uh, compete on the highest level here on the finals. She has a creative line, a dream line she was uh, mentioning to me this morning. If it would have powder, definitely it's going to be challenging because of the snow. But if it were perfect powder, it would be her dream line, she told me. Look at that technical skiing on that side ledge there. Yeah, it's cool. It's similar so far to uh, the line we saw from Marion Atty, skiing in the sun and making sure she links lots of features together. Another beautiful hit there. We don't see as much on the women's side, this creative line choice. Yeah, lots of creative side hits. The backcountry freestyle rider was saying to me that she went home to Innsbruck between Andorra stop and now and uh, tried to go free riding, but ended up having too much fun skiing backcountry freestyle in park. So. Sending this like a free rider, though, stomping that air at the bottom. And Ari Tricomi lining up this double down the bottom, maybe. Another hit there at the bottom. Yeah, we're just holding our breath if we see some big action from the Italian veteran by now. She came on tour. She came with a complete fresh style. We knew there is some big years ahead of her, and I claim that this is the Freeride World Tour champion run of 2019 with the golden bib, and she will keep it. Yeah, putting her hands up, and deservedly really cool creative run from Ari. Smile on her face, why not? Out of South Tyrol, the German-speaking part of Northern Italy, and we see this line completely different to any of the other girls today. And Do I'm you think it'll be on I'm the podium? Um, I don't think it's going to be a podium, to be honest. But enough to take the overall World Tour title? Will it be a podium? Just by. Wow, it's going to be tight. Definitely not the top part of the podium. Elizabeth Gerritsen, we can already congratulate you for the win. That was insane. But here we have Ariana Tricomi. I think there was a little bit of too much hesitation on some of the, some of the part segments that she hit. And uh, I'm speculating that she did a little bit of calculation on top. Because we know that she can go more throttle than we've seen it right now. But well, smart she picked riding, a lot of cool features, you know, but as you said, a little bit slower between them than she often yeah. is. So smart riding, good riding, cool to see something new and creative and different. Uh, like you said, I think that it should be enough to claim her the overall world title to a title again this year. Keep that golden bib. But nervous moments is not certain at all. And Jacqueline Pollard could still potentially be your free ride world tour champion this year. Ooh, exciting times. Here comes the score. 81.2 oh! second place for Ariana Tricomi. Right behind Elizabeth Garrison, right in front of Hazel Birnbaum. <laughs> and that means that she is the Freeride World Tour champion in 2019, just like she was last year. Elizabeth Garrison, the local rider, taking home the 2019 Verbier Extreme title. Ariana Tricomi taking home second. Super exciting times here. Oh, yeah. Congratulations to the two ladies. Elizabeth Gerritsen for the win here in Verbier in her hometown venue with mom and all the family watching. Ah, couldn't be any better. So exciting. So exciting for the girls <laughs> and Gillian Lopez. He's here beside us in the Covenant Tree Box, absolutely going off about it. Cheers, Gillian, and cheers to all the girls. Amazing show here today. 
Looks like they might be tears, and why not? I wouldn't blame you. It's such an emotional day, standing at the top, being so scared, coming to the bottom, after putting down the run that you want to. Just the emotion pumping through the veins, the adrenaline, the relief, the pressure is relieved. We not have to do any more competitions until next year. Now, the last competition of 2019. The pressure is off. These women have been competing and throwing down all year. And it's all been released now. It's probably party times in Verbier tonight. Oh, yeah. Looking forward to the party because uh, the Italian, she knows how to have a good time. And not only on skis, but also in the evening. What a happy camper. And Hazel Birnbaum, the American veteran, taking home third today. And what she has said is her last run on the Freeride World Tour. She is retiring from competitive freeriding after this competition. And what a way to finish it off, taking a podium home. Here we have the results of today. The Swiss, Elizabeth Gerritsen. Did we ever have a Swiss winner here at the Bec de Ross? I'm not so sure. Like on the ski or snowboard, uh, ski women category, I mean. I'm not so sure. Ariana Tricomi in second place, taking second place and the overall win. Hazel Birnbaum finishing her career on the podium, as you just mentioned. Jacqueline Pollard in fourth, Hedwig Vessel in fifth, and Jacqueline Passer, the veteran, going big. Unfortunately, couldn't hold on. And... Uh, it, finishes in sixth position. Such a show from the ladies here today. That was incredible stuff. Really, really impressive. And great to see Elizabeth Gerritsen fulfilling her potential, really hitting her straps <laughs> yeah. there. That was just so fast, so committed, strong and confident. Maybe it's good. her mum should probably travel with her and watch more of the competition. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She should have her as a coach. And here we have the overall ranking. It is official. Ariana Tricomi out of Italy with 9,100 points. What a season for her. Jacqueline Pollard, second in her first ever World Tour season, 2019. The rookie, I'm going to say, claiming it. She's probably the rookie of the year. Uh, why not? I mean, like, almost taking the World Tour title. Looking so fit, strong, and confident. Fantastic stuff. And Elizabeth Gerritsen jumping up into third. Yeah, just overtaking Hedwig Vessel, who had a little hard time today. But uh, definitely uh, a girl to watch out for this for the seasons to come. What? Yeah, I'm just looking forward to seasons because this action what we've seen from the ski women today was just mind-blowing such a stacked field Birnbaum uh, Jacqueline Passo and then uh, Juliet Willemann and Maud Bess not starting today uh, so let's throw it down to the finish area where Ed Lee has got another champion interview coming up at you Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Ari's just said to us, she's catching her breath you can just breathe but she literally it uttered she uttered from her mouth I love skiing yeah I love skiing <laughs> For sure, I, I love skiing, not because I do well in comps, just because it's my biggest love. <laughs> I hope Sven is not <laughs> jealous. <laughs> uh, congratulations. That, that, there was so much pressure building up to this event for you. Um, I don't know. I was feeling so good at the start, and I was just telling me it's just another day of skiing, and snow conditions were not the easiest, but... I'm just so happy I made it down and seeing Elizabeth in first was the scenario I was hoping for, so I'm stoked, <laughs> yeah. I congrats, your double world champion. Um, were you focusing at all on trying to defend your title or, or what, were, what was your aim here today? What, tell me a little bit about that and maybe tell us a little bit about your line. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> since I won the first comp, I was like, oh, maybe it could happen again, but it was never like my main goal. Mm -hmm. My main goal is just to enjoy skiing and get better at it. Today, I, my line was very playful, I think, for the back. I was trying to just uh, find something that fits my style, and I, I made it. I enjoyed myself, and I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> How was the snow on that side? Because everyone else had obviously opted for the other start. So you're out on your own. And there was a lot of talk about whether the snow quality would be any good. Um, yeah, the snow was actually not super easy. It was pretty crusty on top, but still like you could break through. So it was not like super catchy. I think my amazing skis work pretty well because they're like very soft and rockery. And I'm actually glad I skied there because I was the last woman skiing today and I don't want to ski track snow. Okay, we can take a closer look at your line now on the line tracker. Um, for me, I think it was, it was that opening cliff up at the top that, was, that really set the judges uh, and, and showed them that you meant business. You think? 
Yeah, I really like that one. It, was, it looked super technical. It's quite exposed. Uh, yeah, I actually like the third cliff and like the transfer kind of cliff were so tricky and I, I did a tail bonk on the rocks. Stoked, <laughs> putting some freestyle in there. <laughs> it was not on purpose though. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. I'm stoked with the line. I, I saw it right away already three days ago and I'm like, that's what I want to ride. Then I started like overthinking a little bit, like, ah, oh, maybe I should get gnarly because we're on the back. But then I just stay true to my style and <laughs> it works. That was one of the things you said, Lorraine, because you've been in this position, same position yeah. as Ari. What do you do and do you let the other person skiing dictate to you? Yeah, I think Ari obviously just had the really good strategy to stay true to herself, to be focused on your own skiing, to not think too much, for example, ah, oh, what's Jacqueline going to do? Maybe I should do this and to, to lose your own style. So I think it's just a, a really impressive display of how to deal with these high pressure oh. competition situations. Thank you, Lorraine. <laughs> World champion telling me this, yeah! It's starting to sink in now, isn't it? I can oh, see it. And let's get the party started, friends. <laughs> I'm ready. Okay, Ariana taking out her second world title. It's been defended. And Elizabeth Gerritsen taking out the win here. A fantastic high level of skiing here. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to start lining things up for the men's snowboarding and the men's skiing. We'll see you in a second. Welcome back. Now it's time to move on to the men's, but we've seen some incredible skiing and snowboarding from the women there. The level was very, very high. Yeah, it was super solid. We, we saw very few mistakes, uh, no crashes at all. The, the girls just used the terrain that was available to them. Um, super stoked to see the women just throwing down like that. And then Marion Hetty, you said it was a big call to throw down the run of your life. She certainly sent it. Yeah, for sure. Like, and you could see like she wanted it really hard. Putting a little 360 in there was really cool. That double at the end, I was like, where is she going? But she pulled it off and like her smile at the end was like the sunshine. That's, that's why you all do it. Uh, now, if you're just joining us, this is the grand final of the Free Ride World Tour, the most prestigious title in competitive free riding. This is the Extreme Verbier. Uh, if you're new to the world of free riding, then we've got a little clip for you now that shows you exactly what this world is all about about. What is competitive freeriding? Well, after years of having fun, people began to wonder who was best. And so it began. A crew of skiers held a competition in Alaska. Next was Switzerland with the extreme verbia. Gradually, these contests spread across the world and joined together as a single tour. And so it went global, the big show. But in the end, it comes down to one rider atop a mountain. 
And while safety equipment is abundant, the rules remain remarkably simple. There's a start on a peak and a finish at the bottom. There are no gates, no piste, no clock, and there's no practice run. Riders rely on a visual inspection and their imagination to create a line. Runs are judged using five subjective criteria, which means any approach or style has the potential to win. For riders, the pressure is immense and the margin between success and failure narrow. Over the years, competition has driven the sport to new heights, and now the only certainty is progression. This is competitive free riding. Hopefully that's got you in the mood. Uh, it is a subjective sport and we have undoubtedly one of the most intimidating venues in sport for this to play out on. It's the Beck de Ross. It stands behind us in shadow and a north face that is just a giant steep pile of rocks. The men's snowboarding is coming up very shortly and in the field of six men dropping is literally a legend of the sport, a 53-year-old man who won the first ever Extreme Verbier in 1996, Steve Klassen. Xavier, you competed against him. What does it mean to have him riding on this face? Well, to be honest, like I remember the first time I competed here. I saw him, he was the idol. He was throwing lines that everybody was so stoked. And to be honest, I think there's no better legend than him on this mountain. And I think we should put a statue with his face at the top. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you've recently retired, Lorraine. It's, how, how do you feel about someone 53 years of age getting on this face? And I mean, he's going to be competitive up there. We watched him yeah. forerun last year and the line was really strong. Yeah, like you said, he's not just doing it to survive and to just get down. He has an inner drive that I really admire um, to, to keep coming back year after year and throwing down. And I think it's because he has a love affair with this mountain. He's so passionate and that passion gives him the drive and the energy. Steve Klassen has a fever and the only cure is the Beck de Ross. Uh, let's hear <laughs> from the horse's mouth right now. We sacked Steve Klassen down to find out how he feels about this mountain. I'll tell you, whenever I, uh, I guess whenever I think about going from not the top, it just doesn't sit right with me. So I, uh, I've thought about that three, start three line, but it's just not in my heart. I'm gonna go off the summer no matter what, man. And so I wanna go off the summit because if this happens to be the last time I compete here, I wanna go off the summit, man. I don't wanna go off the shoulder. So I guess that's where I got to in choosing my line. Although I wanna to try to take that big air off the top, that's my ultimate line. But if I get there and it looks too heavy, I won't. But I really want to go for that, man. I just really have it in me that that's how I want to set the pace for my run. I mean, this is my last shot, I guess. You know, and it's, uh, um, I'm going to rise to the moment. I'm going to lose myself in that moment. And I'm just going to go for it, man. Because <laughs> that's what you do when you get up there. <laughs> it's, it's a trip. It's like nothing else in the world. To me, it's the ultimate rush that I've found in snowboarding. And I, uh, I, ha I just have to keep coming back as much as I, I, can. I don't know how to not do it. It's the ultimate rush, that mountain, top to bottom. If I can stay on my feet, <sighs> that's it. Wow, that's a uh, pretty emotional speech there from Steve Klassen. You guys saw him this morning in the igloo up at the top. He, he did look nervous. Yeah, of course you would. Like, he's got a big name to stand up for. And even at 53, he's inspiring us all. But, you know, he's not one to just want to go there. He wants to go and show the show. You know, like, he's got it. Like, yeah, and, and I think we're going to see some cool stuff from him. And he's the only rider going off the top, Lorraine. Yeah, I understand that he's the only snowboarder who is going off the top and he's aware of the conditions being variable. He knows it. I think that's one of the reasons why he's feeling nervous. But like he said in that interview, he's got like this inner 
gut feeling he just has to start from the top. So let's see. Well, he, he touched on there the idea of line choice and that that's everything on the Beck de Ross. There are some faces where everyone's taking similar lines. They may be playing around a central theme, but here there are so many options. Where do you start, Zav, when you're trying to build a line? Well, I think you, you start with the heart, I think. Uh, you know, you just try to look a feature or a little zone that really inspires you. And then you kind of build up around it to see if everything works out and if you can connect everything together to make it align. And then at the end, you kind of validate if it's safe or not and if you feel like it. And then once you've, you decide to go for it, you need to go for it. Well, that's exactly what you yeah. did last year, Lorraine. Yeah, I think what uh, Zav said with you start with the heart is basically your intuition, right? You let your intuition guide you. What is it that I'm excited about? And then you might start thinking more cognitively about what can the judges see? What are they looking for? But I think the key is to first stay with your heart. Absolutely. That's what I would recommend any free rider to do. Okay. Well, we can hear now from Marcus Eder, Sammy Lubke, Drew Tabke, uh, and Christopher Turdell on exactly how they choose their lines. One of the defining parts of freeride is that it, it is a lot harder than people realize and it's because of this visual inspection element where we go into the mountains and look at look at a big alpine face and have to pick a line. You don't see that when you watch the live stream, all you see is the performance side of it. It's really a couple days of homework and studying that's leading up to the big, big day when we actually go up there and rip it. I've seen the best skiers and snowboarders in the world come down it and if you're not prepared, you know, the. The back's definitely a monster. It'll eat you up. Um, you got to be on, on point. A lot of no-fall zones. For sure, you can be the craziest skier, but if you don't put enough uh, homework into it, it might, might not, but it's most likely that you could make a mistake. Because we're not allowed to be on the mountain before the comp, it's it takes a lot to, to look at it and try to turn it around in your head and actually being able to ski something uh, uh, because it looks so different when you're standing up on that top. When you're actually up there looking down it or you're on it riding it, like sometimes the features look a lot different and it's that's super challenging about it. What I try to do is just like visualize my run as much as I possibly can so when I'm riding it, it feels like I've already ridden it. kind of have a guideline uh, where I want to go and like a few uh, A, B, C options. Once again, yeah, getting to the top, that'll kind of play a little part into the line I choose as well. There's a couple things you can see on the hike up that make a huge difference in just the, that big decision, you know, one run. The night before the calm, I try to visualize my line. You know exactly, okay, I get to this point, I see this rock, how does it look? And if there's something I don't know in my mind, I just keep checking pictures, I go back to them. Look for something fun at first and then um, start building it piece by piece. So find maybe one feature I like a lot and then link it to a feature above and a feature below and kind of build out from maybe my favorite zone on the mountain. Snow conditions are everything when picking a line. Um, you really want, you know, it's hard because a lot of times it's really wind packed and fast, so a lot of the cliffs are really big and you want some soft snow for that landing, especially for shutting down, shutting down your speed going into the next feature, which could be, you know, right there because, you know, things do come up quicker than they look. You know, the mountain's big, but there's so many features in there. Decision's amazing. You watch guys like Christopher Turdell or Raina Barkrid in particular. And even though they're going maybe 70 to 80 kilometers an hour, they're normally not within uh, 50 centimeters away from probably how they would draw it on the picture before they went and did it. Percentage wise, if I have to say something, I would say uh, all of the guys that's competing here are, are good enough to put down a winning run. So in the end, it might come up to who has the strongest head and who really commits to, this, to, the, to uh, their line. And uh, that's uh, very important here. Well, this shot gives you an idea of the rocky maze that is the Beck de Ross. You guys have both done this 
for your entire careers. How difficult is it to take a line that you see through a set of binoculars and then turn it into a physical run, to turn it around? Because when you're looking with binoculars, you're looking at the face, suddenly then you're looking down on top of it and all of those features change. Yeah, they all look white and they all look the same. And basically knowing where you are, knowing which one is your jump, knowing the direction which you need to choose on it, is something mandatory and it actually takes years to, to, um, to acquire. And even if you're a really good free rider, even if you've been riding for 20, 30 years, if you have not been either filming or competing, you will not really have developed that uh, sense of seeing the face and being able to transfer it in, into your head to what it actually looks when you're riding it from the top. I mean, you, you've done it on this face, Lorraine. I mean, the, the consequences are even bigger when you take it on the Bec de Ross. And there are no trees. There are no, there were very few snow features. It must be incredibly easy to get lost here. Um, the key to competing here is to prepare and to do your homework. You know, it's hours and hours of memorizing the shape of the terrain. First of all, also knowing through experience, um, what am I going to see when in the line? What does help definitely is all the POV or the GoPro footage that is now available. That's a huge help for sure. And an athlete needs to be able to visualize in the first person and go through the whole film without the film ever interrupting. And once you can do that from top to bottom, honestly, for the brain, it's as if you've done the run because as far as the brain is concerned, there's not much difference between doing it in reality or doing it in your mind. And that's our practice run. Okay, we're getting into some pretty heavy sports psychology here. I like this. Uh, the main part of this is though that you're dealing with an incredibly steep mountain. We're gonna take a closer look at the face now. This is one of the most unique venues in free riding you can see that green area at the bottom is as steep as the steepest black runs you'll find anywhere in a resort 35 to 45 degrees is the yellow there and then the top section and the cliff bands the red and the black i mean the black's vertical the red is anywhere up to 60 degrees and this is the view that i love lorraine zav talk us through this because as we swing around here we get the rider's eye view and this just looks insane I think when we all think of being up there at the top, you know, we think of that feeling of void that you can have. You stand at the top and all you see is really the bottom and you see that vision, it's not really inviting, you know, it's all dark and it's all like heavy and all you see is like everybody sitting with a cocktail at the bottom <laughs> in the sunshine. So yeah, it's big, big, big mind game. Yeah. And just knowing if you fall in that top section, you're not going to stop until the very bottom. So you know you've got to be solid, you have to commit. It's, it's going to challenge you in all facilities. OK, we can take a look back at some of the biggest lines this face has ever seen over the years. And we're going to start with yours, Xavier, from 2010. This, I think this bear's talking about because at the time it was completely unique in, the, in snowboarding terms. It, it was a new area, it, there was a new cliff in there, and it turned the speed right up. How did this line speak to you? When did you spot it? Well, to be honest, I had seen it in the season, I had seen it from the bottom and I had seen that if you change your perspective, so look at it from a different angle, you could see that there was actually a fairly <laughs> good enough space for landing. And that one year I arrived in Verbia a bit in the same position as Victor. I kind of needed to stay on my feet to win the title. But I was like, there's no way I'm going to go and just do a mellow run. I'm going to send it. I've got that line in my heart and I know I feel it. I'm going to stomp it. And I think it's been one of the best moments of my life, you know, when you have that crazy confidence. I've never found it again after. <laughs> really? <laughs> this is one of the high points of your career? Yeah, it's definitely, uh, like, to be honest, competing after this one year, I always felt like it would be impossible to do as good as this. And um, I kind of thought that I had reached my peak and that I was on the downhill. I remember watching this as just a super fan and you saw runs like this in videos, but you never saw runs like this in competition. And for me, that's why this one was so groundbreaking. But this, this is the crux now, where you have to take your foot off the brake and open up into the cliff. Yeah, and, it, and it's also that that jump is so high in the face and you need to be so precise to line the landing and you really don't want to crash there, so yeah. Can there. you remember what it felt like here? Yeah, totally, I had to align these two rocks together to know that would give me the direction, and then I knew I had to take like a little 10 meters of straight line before the, the jump, and I was like almost a bit short, but 
It's, yeah, like, you could almost not see the landing there, right? Yeah, of no, the no, no. I had to trust my vision. You know, I knew there was the angle of the rocks, and I needed to follow it. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, sometimes you need that. Yeah, you've got that thing inside you which makes you do these kind of lines, but and it's not every day, so you need to enjoy it. This yeah. line is a brilliant illustration of the gradient as well, because you're desperately trying to shut down the speed. And yet it's impossible. The, the gradient of the face is just egging you on, dragging you down. Yeah, and you, you know you can't fight it too much. You just need to let it go, and then the, the speed will slow down gradually. You can't just say, okay, now I want to slow down, because if you do, it's explosion. You know, you need to go with the flow, as they say. <laughs> okay, after that, in 2012, we saw the skier uh, Oakley White Allen come in. And, I mean, you can talk us through this, Lorraine. This, this was a phenomenal line. Yeah, maybe interesting background story to Oakley's line. As he was hiking up, he actually pulled a muscle in his uh, hamstring. <laughs> so he had to completely change his strategy. So from doing his original plan of airing, I don't know what he was planning on, he had to just basically say, I can't do any airs. So I'm just going to straight line the back. <laughs> Which <laughs> is a, a pretty bold strategy as it turns out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it ended up being one of the most impressive lines to see just because of the sheer speed. And also, that's that's commitment, right? I mean, there is no turning back. Yeah, and, and like it's so cool to see someone do that because for the judging criteria, it's not a line that would score, mm -hmm. but we've all been dreaming of seeing someone just pointing down, <laughs> and he did it. That was so Thanks, cool. Thanks, Oakley. <laughs> um, and then we come forward. One of the things I really like is that... The Bec de Ross is, is almost a living, breathing venue for sport because snow conditions change year on year. So there's always the possibility for new lines to open up. And we saw that last year, 2018, with the local Jan Rosis came in and landed just an insane... He came into the heart zone in the middle of the line, opened up a completely new cliff. I think... This was possible last year because maybe we had the best conditions ever last year. I don't know what you think yeah, about that stuff. Yeah, it was stuff, like uh, one of the plus, plus, plus years yeah. for sure. Yeah. And Jan is one of those riders who will take hours to study. I think he also has that, that drive to do something innovative, something new. He's incredibly intelligent. And yeah, I, I could imagine after a lot of scoping, he, he saw this new line. Yeah, and he lives here, so yeah, like same same as me, you know, you see that mountain all the time and then slowly the mountain speaks to you in a way, you see this little thing opening. And I think that's the beauty with this face is that every year, even after 25 years, you get new lines coming down and that's... That's so incredible, and it always sets the standard to where the level of free riding is. The thing that I always think about with this, because I put it in a layman's perspective, is you're Jan Rosis, and you're thinking, well, in 23 years of competition, no one's done this line. Why? And I, I'd be, I'd be, I mean, that's just insane. And then again, he's got to shut this speed down in the heart zone. Yeah. <sighs> but yeah, he had the courage to do it, the courage of his convictions, and he committed to that line. Yeah, we see more and more lines which include transfers, like Marcus has been the master of them this year. And it's so nice to see that because it opens so many possibilities. And this is kind of the spirit of what Jan Rosis did there. Okay, it's a very different case in terms of snowfall this year. Uh, great early season snow, but it's heated up over the last uh, six weeks or so. So a lot of different challenges on the face this year, Zav. Yeah, like to be honest, seeing the girls, you saw some amazing turns and then in some places where you expected really good snow, it became all of a sudden really hard. Like we saw Hetzel like uh, really getting into that section with look pure powder. I would have put my hand, which, you know, to say that it would have been powder and then you could have seen she could just uh, hold her edge on. So I yeah. think riders are going to have to be super careful, really smart as well. Lorraine, I mean, you've, you've skied this in all conditions. How do you think people are going to deal with this? Are we going to see people rain back the runs or do you think it's going to be a send fest? I mean, part of line choice is definitely taking the conditions into consideration. You know, that, that's something that a free rider has to adapt to. Uh, it's part of the game. I always told myself, look, it's the same conditions for everyone. But... Um, yeah, you can't ignore conditions. You definitely have to take that into consideration. If it's super crusty or firmer, then that would be, for me, a year where I'm going to 
take cliffs that are not as high as a year where it's super powdery and maybe compact powder or something like that. Okay, we're going to kick off today with the men's snowboard category and your brother, Victor Delarue, is in there, Zav. The nerves rising I a little know, bit? I know, yes, I am. <laughs> like, I've got that little ball in my stomach. And yeah, not only because it's the back de Ross and it's uh, scary, but I want him to, to do well and yeah. <sighs> God, I'm, I'm with him right now. <laughs> well, imagine how your mum feels, Zav. Yeah, exactly. I, I know like what she's been always <laughs> telling me all my life. Oh, you're crazy, you're crazy. No, watch him. Oh, I feel the same. <laughs> okay, a lot of pressure on him. Same position that we saw Ariana in earlier. Um, he's got to deliver a line. He's He's got a, maybe a little more breathing room from Davy Baird than Ariana had from Jacqueline Pollard, but mm. he's still got to land his run here. Yeah, and the difference with Ariana is that... Uh, uh, sorry, Davy is after him, so he cannot just watch Davy and be like, oh, okay, now I can just send it, it doesn't matter anymore. So he's got to do his run and then Davy will has to have to do his. So <laughs> that's going to be interesting. But I really told him, don't worry about the judges, just do the run that comes yeah, into your heart once again, because that's how it works. Okay, we can take a closer look at the Beck de Ross now and some of the big features that make this face uh, so important. So you take a look here. This is known as the dog leg kawar. It runs down the looker's left hand side of the face. And this is one of the more straightforward lines. So if you're looking for this one, it's it's pretty easy. And then out here on the looker's right hand side, right at the top, we can see your Cliff Xavier named after you, the Delarue Cliff. Oh, oh. It, it actually looks under, it just doesn't look possible from that angle. Yeah. It looks terrifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very modest, Zav. It's, that's a trait you'll find amongst a lot of big mountain riders. And then right down here in the middle of the face, it's called the central couloir. Uh, I think that's a bit of a euphemism. It's some patches of snow broken up by some huge cliffs, really, isn't it, Lorraine? Yeah, I mean, the, the crown jewel of the central couloir, as we could see there, is Hollywood and the Gilles Rolle cliff. Um, it's a beautiful cliff to jump because the takeoff and the landing is at the same angle. Here we see it now, the Hollywood cliff. So for a skier, for a snowboard, it feels like you're sailing quite far as opposed to a really high air. You, yeah, just, you don't have that kind of bomb drop exactly. mentality. Exactly, yeah, it's a beautiful cliff. Yeah, and if you see photos from the side, you see the riders being like literally a meter and a half above the rocks all the way. It's kind of weird, but it makes it a lot safer and a lot easier to, to stomp. Okay, and then we saw the heart zone just down there on the left-hand side. So you're going to hear the commentators talking about each of those zones throughout the commentary. And now you know exactly what they're talking about. Uh, I think Steve Klassen, one of the few snowboarders who's going to be getting stuck into the dog leg kulwa. But as we've just talked about, Victor, we know that Steve's in there. Let's take a look at the snowboarders season so far. This is how the placings have brought us to the extreme verbier. <laughs> Really easy. It was uh, not an easy thing to do, and neither was that huge 360 he just floated. Cross court. That was exactly what you'd expect from Victor De La Rue. I'm in a pretty good spot already, so the pressure is not too high either. Even if I play it self, it should be kind of okay in a way. First big slash turns, side hit. Beautiful. Nice method for David Beard. Wow, David, that was pretty solid. Making that shoot into a double landing in a slough. Having the chance to become the world champion, it's, you know, it's a little bit mind boggling. The nerves are definitely there, but try to just kind of cast that aside and just want to go snowboarding. You see it? Lee coming with a lot of wind. Lining up his first feature with a huge backflip. Right, fresh stuff, but Blake Hand with a nice 360 as well. It's been a really solid run to this point. Smooth air out of that section. There was only one way out of there, and he made it look like it was no thing. It's a really, well, it's not quite as tight as the women's skiing, but it's still come down to the wire here. Davy Baird and your brother Victor, both in the mix. Victor's had a really fascinating season, though, hasn't he? Transferring all of the skills that he's built up over the last 
15 years really and then transferring them into competition that's that's quite a jump yeah because he's been filming all his life like doing trips making video parts so you learn there a lot but you don't have that competition aspect and to be honest at the beginning of the season i thought it would be really difficult for him to handle because competition you know like you're facing people that have been competing their whole life and they know how to handle the stress how to do the night before etc and victor it's just a loose cannon. He's just showing up. Hello, can I compete with you guys? <laughs> <laughs> but he's he's blown my mind, to be honest. Like first come, he kind of didn't find his thing, and then after, you could see he was in there, in the in the zone. He he had it. So I don't need to tell him anything anymore. He's got it. He's it, cover. Yeah. It feels like Victor's at the vanguard alongside Marcus Eda of skiers and snowboarders who are really bringing a lot of freestyle into the freeride world tour. It feels like you can't win a run this year without a three or at least a backflip. But then you arrive on this face and it's a very different ball game, isn't it? It's much harder to find a spot for some freestyle here. It is, but I mean, look at Marcus's run last year. He had a really technical upper section. He just combines both you know it's amazing to see really well-rounded athletes that way and I loved his run in Fieberbrunn where he's using the whole terrain and and those transitions and like a big turn with speed air landing turn it's awesome to watch like I have to say I'm very excited to, his to see his line today and I really hope that he'll be able to deal with the pressure because I think he's he might be a little bit nervous. I think he's going to be feeling the pressure. I would talk about last year's winner here, Sammy Lubke. He's one of the riders who's impressed me the most by developing his big mountain skills on this face. He came onto the tour very much as a freestyle orientated rider, but his line last year proved that he's got some really, really strong big mountain smarts now. Yeah, completely. The line, you know, you could see, like the line from Sammy last year, you could see that he had kind of uh, like dealt with uh, the fear of the Bec de Ross and that he had taken all those years to step things up and to become a mature big, uh, big mountain rider and like you could see his line it was like oh now now you own it like now you've got your name on it for real yeah well we can see it here from last year I mean you were you were nodding away Lorraine this this one is it, it ceases to become about skiing and snowboarding on the Bec doesn't it it's just about the line and how you deal with this gradient and the speed so. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, where we might see differences with skiing snowboard is how you can deal with variable conditions. You know, if we have firmer conditions, it can be challenging on a snowboard, whereas if it's a cross, it, it may be a little bit easier. Completely, uh, yeah. yeah uh, Usually so snowboarders shine a lot better when it's really pow and, yeah. and uh, more like consistent conditions. And I think skiers are a lot more able to adapt to change his snow. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. This For me, this was one of the key parts of his run. We see him come into the top here and he makes the traverse into the top of the central couloir. And I watched a lot of skiers come in afterwards and the speed only having a single edge to use. Mm. There was no hesitation from Sammy and he needed to shut down a lot of speed in a really, really critical zone. So he comes around the bottom here and then he doesn't hesitate as he drops into this main part of the face. Like regarding the speed, I think it's really how Xavier said before, you have to realize you're not going to be slowing down. You've got to like accept the speed, make friends with it because there is no stopping. And, and to just know, okay, later, lower down in the phase, that's where I'm going to be able to control the speed again fully is just something you have to do on, on this phase. I'm, I'm going to take that one and steal it somewhere. You have to make friends with the speed. Yeah. <laughs> No, and to be honest, for riders that enter this side of the face, so Luca's right side of the face, you know, they enter a zone where you have absolutely no right for error. And this is like true, scary, cold, <laughs> heavy big mountain. And um, yeah, like seeing Sami get in there last year was like, okay, he, he's, he's got a step in his own snowboarding. And yeah. then that centerpiece drop, probably yeah. 10 meters from takeoff to landing, very, very <laughs> solid. And he shuts the speed down so successfully into that bottom cliff, turns that into the double here. I mean, it was a really, really strong line. Um, one of the lovely things, I mean, that was Sammy's run from last year, but we've talked about Steve Klassen already, but we're gonna get to see uh, essentially a history lesson. The guy who won the first ever Extreme Verbier come down and, I mean, his hunger's still there, so it's going to be a, a, a brilliant way of comparing and contrasting the styles and the way lines have developed over the last 24 years. 
Yeah, I think uh, I really remember back in the day. So my, my first time competing was in 2002. So it was like six, seven years after. And you could see that riders back in the days were a lot more looking for features rather than making a line, you know. And I think when Jeremy De Jones came, maybe it was in 2007 or something like this, I remember watching him do a really direct line, you know, that totally came from the film uh, Inspiration. And it really clicked in my head, telling, telling myself, oh, actually, this is a lot nicer. He's not just trying to get as much as he can. He's trying to, to get a line that's beautiful, that makes sense, and not forcing anything, letting the nature and just adapt to it. And yeah, that was a big moment for me to change things in my head. Okay, we are ready now to get the men's snowboarding underway. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, you'll be with Neil Williman and Martin McFly Winkler, who are going to take you through the men's snowboard category. about to see, I assume, some incredible runs from the guys, ski and snowboard. Three different starts here on the Big De Ross on the main face here today, Martin McFly Winkler. Oh man, I'm so excited. The show is kicking off with the men, snowboard and skiing, and uh, we're gonna have, yeah, so just some incredible lines. I'm uh, talking to the riders, what they're, what they're, they have to offer today will be just mind blowing, just uh, thinking of it. Yeah. Watching the, the pre-show just then with uh, Ed and Zev, it just really got me super psyched for that, Lorraine as well, uh, talking through what the riders are thinking and feeling, the process of planning a line, what goes into it, the, the mental effort, the stress. Uh, so all of these guys are going to have gone through that in the last couple of days and probably looking forward to getting it over and done with. The FWT ranking for 2019, as you probably just heard from the pre-show, Victor Delarue in line to probably take his first ever free World Tour title in his first ever year. Davey Beard, though, not far behind. I think the stats are that if Victor crashes and comes last and Davey wins, then he can overtake him in the title race. Blake Ham and Sammy Lubke, the defending World Tour champion, not too far behind, battling it out for the third place on the podium. Yeah, um, uh, Sammy right behind would be uh, Gigi Ruf. Unfortunately, he will be not competing here today. Jonathan Pen Penfield and uh, Ludo Guyadiat and Thomas Feuerstein rounding up uh, the ranking at the overall standings. So Blake Ham uh, giving me a wee correction today on the front side and back side. Apparently I called it wrong in his last competition <laughs> run. So give an extra close eye out for that. It sounds like he's planning to spin today. Also really liked his words in the pre-show, the interview they had with Blake Ham, where it's really tough to turn it around. Because what you're doing is, is mirror imaging the face. Once you look at it from the bottom, you get used to what's on the right, what's on the left, and you have to swap that around at the top. Looking at the star list now. Here we have the start list of today's competition at the Snowbird Man. Jonathan Penfield opening up the field with the veteran just behind him, Steve Klassen. 
There is no more experienced rider than this guy here we have, than the rookie kind of wor world champion to become, Victor de la Rue, Blakeham, David Beard, who will be the only competitor who can challenge Victor de la Rue in becoming world champion, and Sammy Lipke and Gigi Ruf, unfortunately not here, but uh, still on the start list. That's right, Sammy is here. Uh, Sammy is looking to become the second rider to get four World Tour finals wins here on the Victor Ross. Zav Delarue, the other person with four World Tour wins, and Steve Clarkson with five. But if Sammy Lipke wins here today, it'll be four in a row, and it'll be the first time that has ever been done. So really strong American field there. I think that Victor Delarue, the World Tour champion in waiting, in the wings, hoping to get out there onto the center stage there, is the only non-American. So really interesting. Why do you think we have an American-dominated field there? Of course, like uh, free riding, it has a big, big tradition in uh, the US of A, and uh, uh, they have been always strong to uh, come back on tour or stay on tour. So uh, yeah, we ended up with a with a really stacked. Uh, field out of US of A. That's right, and Jonathan Penfield, the first one out of the USA, the first guy snowboarder to drop in today. I really, really like his style. He's got a great mix of solid big mountain charging with a bit of freestyle added in there as well. The biochemist out of the USA, out of Tahoe, now living in Canada. He's on course. Already going big, cross court over that cliff rock feature there. And turning it back into the fall line, transferring as well, and another one as well with the 360. Jonathan Penfield, <laughs> what a way to get things started here. Three massive features already. Straight back into the fall line, looking to surf the spine on his way to his next features. This has blown my mind, mate. Oh, yeah, he knows how to impress the judges with tricks and going another 360 of a huge ramp. Yeah, Beautiful really stomp. impressive stuff with the backside <laughs> three there from Jonathan. He's on a roll, man. This is incredible stuff. Getting over above the exposure now. I'm not sure if you can quite see in the zoomed in version on your screen, but you do not want to be falling here. This is a super exposed technical part of the face. Getting over towards part of the girls' venue here and making the most of it really fast through that double. And what a way to open the guy snowboarding. Jonathan Petfield, hands up. He's not even done. He's got another feature coming up. I've lost track. <laughs> yeah. Now he's really milking that, uh, that run. He's going all the way down with feature after feature. Jonathan Penfield. Oh, yeah. Take a bow. That was an incredible run. Absolutely unbelievable. He said after his first few runs of this season, three solid runs, uh, no podiums yet. And uh, what a way to, to turn it around. <laughs> what a way to finish the competitive season, both on the face and in the finish area. Love this guy's riding, and what a show from him here today. Uh, called that wrong, though. I thought it was a 360, and it was a grab. He did 360 later. Here going for the back three, putting it straight to his feet and all the judging criteria lines right up into the green. Yeah, what a complete run we saw from Jonathan Penfield. Oh, he knows a thing or two. He has been competing on the back for some, some years already. Very smart guy, the biochemist in his real job with a solid score from the first rider down the back. 85 points yeah, straight. Yeah, really, really solid run to start things off from Jonathan Penfield. If that is a sign of things to come, then we're going to see some heavy hitting runs today. We saw 85 from him. And when we had an 80 out of Hazel Josie Birnbaum in her opening run in the women's skiing category, we thought that was going to be right up there. She did end up clinching a podium, but only just. And here we have, I hope you saw the pre-show, Steve Klassen. If not, have a look at the age number. It's five and four. And this is incredible. He has a few gray hair that already <laughs> started when he competed here because he competed 18 times. It's, it's his 18th time here on the Bac de Ross. We have the 24th edition of the Extreme here today, and uh, he's competing up. Of course, he said he wants to ride from the peak. There are two other options, which is not obvious, not, not as every year. But uh, because of uh, safety reasons, we offer the riders two other options to start off. But of course, he said, if I ride the back, it has to be from the top. And That's here right. we go. I believe he's the only guy starting from the top in the guy's snowboarding today. So the super legend, he has five wins here on the Beck de Ross, looking to make it six here today. Getting in the zone, just out of the start gate. Hell, he's on him. And About to get on course. To give you a little bit of an uh, inside view why he's up there, there was actually a, a plan of doing a master's segment for uh, a few veterans on of the Freeride World Tour, just like uh, Orléans Ducro, or uh, I'm not sure if it 
Kai Sackerson should be in there, but uh, it was, uh, I think, the plan to have uh, Xavier De La Rue as well. They pulled out last minute, so he was like, what shall we do? And Nicholas Haywood, the founder of the Freud World Tour and the Verbi Extreme, he said, you're in. If you want, you can compete with the big boys. And yeah, so he said, Steve. I'm in. Nice, buddy. Getting Age out onto the 54, main base now. challenging the back the Ross. That's right. Five victories cannot be overtaken today. Sammy Lubke has three. In in Going for a huge first one cliff and, and stomping a clean guy. Are you kidding me, Steve? So <laughs> solid. Off a looker's left version of the Rainer Cliff at the top, the Rainer Buckley Cliff. <laughs> what are you going to grab off this transfer coming back into the dog leg call right now? What a way to start things off from the veteran. Unbelievable action. This is such a huge cliff. Of course, he has hit it before in the past. It is one of the winning lines that he has been uh, doing in the past, but that's ages ago. And he still got it. It's unbelievable. So steep and technical in here. I think the camera angle doesn't quite do it justice. There's a bit of exposure beneath him as well. And if you get a chance to come look at this with your own eyes, people, then I highly recommend coming down to Verbia to see this because it is blowing my mind right now, the steep technical Going for another huge big air. Cliff. Unfortunately, a back slap in there, but he's riding out clean after. And this is pretty rock solid, what I've heard from the forerunners in that segment. He's at the end of the... Going for a 360 over the ledge. Sorry to not finish my sentences. <laughs> We're too this excited. is mind blowing of the 54 year old Steve Klassen. Coming down through the bottom of the heart zone now. Looking to get another air. Doing so successfully. Stomping on that one. A little bit of a revert, but wow, really impressive stuff. Making light work of the of the gnarly venue. Steve Klassen cruising on down now. Uh, just if you're on the couch or anywhere you're watching, please stand up. But this was unbelievable, unprecedented stuff. Just can you imagine? Putting another head on the bottom. Was that a 360 as well to finish things off? It was. In one edition, he did a 720 of that lip, you have to know. No yes. way. Steve Klassen. But that's like legend. 15 years ago or plus. <laughs> yeah. As I was saying, five wins on the Victor Ross, Steve Klassen. Xavier Adelaide with four, Sammy Lubke with three. We can't yet be overtaken. Will it happen in the future? I don't know. But for now, soak in the sunshine, Steve Klaassen. That was an impressive run. Taking on cliffs that would be scary for any snowboarder. Yeah. Ah, uh, and imagine how many people would think, like, come on, don't let him ride. Oh, He's so bad, old. Bad. And he really proved good. them all wrong. Sure. He shut the mouse. It's oh, <laughs> just, I love it. Amazing. I love it. So cool. <laughs> Oh, just that top air, it's huge. Yeah. And especially this year because it's scraped out sometimes. Uh, it's scraped out of the well, wind. Yeah, so it has crusty. a lot of sun in there. Have a look. Eric the style right boom. up there. And just, just stomping, stomping the piss out of it. <laughs> nice, putting in the 360 there. Another, Another three, three at the bottom. Yes, yeah, I got goosebumps again. Like, this is insane. And he has to, you have clean. to know, back to us, it is his spiritual mountain. There is no more intense connection, what he, dis he has described in the pre show, than uh, 63 points for him. Riding down the back de Ross. Yeah. What a way to show the world what you got at 54 years old. Big ups, hats off. Take a bow, Steve Klassen. Jonathan Manfield holding onto the hot seat for now. Yeah. I think the, the weak control issue that Steve had higher in the face is probably what hurt his score. So, down to the finish area now Ooh. for an interview with the legends. Steve, you have quite literally torn up the rule book on aging with that run. Thank you. <laughs> the top cliff. I, I saw you kind of cragging your way in and there were some gasps down here. That was beautiful. Thank you very much. I'm, I've been looking at that cliff for 25 years. I tried it once before, didn't stick it, stuck it today. It felt freaking awesome. <laughs> and uh, you, did, you got chucked in two 360s. The second one of those was immaculate. Oh, thanks, mate. It just felt great to be up there riding it back again. Well, I saw you this morning and you genuinely, Lorraine and Zav and I talked about it on the show this morning. You look genuinely nervous. I was. I mean, that's, I don't know how to do it and not be nervous after all these years. It's hard not to be nervous. I'm just stoked to be up there doing it. I think you've proved today that the Beck de Ross is a part of your blood. Yeah, it is. And uh, 
I really wanted to go to the top. It didn't feel right not going to the top, so I'm glad I did it, and come up May. I, that's such a strong run. I think anyone watching at home, anyone watching here will give you a standing ovation for that because you won the first edition in 96 and you come back here 24 years later and lay down just a stronger run. Thank you very much. Thank you. Amazing stuff from the veteran legend there, Steve Klaassen. At least for this year, he will still be the one with the most runs. But looking to take his first win as Victor Delarue following the footsteps yep. of his brother, as you saw in the pre-show. Like, what a scenario we have. One of the biggest names in snowboarding, Steve Klassen, just ripped with 54 years of age. And now we have kind of one of the current rippers and biggest names in snowboarding, Victor Delarue. If you don't know him, just check him out. His video parts of the cu last couple of years are just mind-blowing. And he catapulted him into the highest level of snowboarding. He's already a legend with 29 years of age, following the footsteps of his 10-year-old older brother, here now, probably claiming the title. It is in a good way, but uh, he's not thinking too much about the Freeride World Tour title. He wants to have the win here at the Freeride World Tour. Finals as well, opening up with a big drop. Huge transfer off the top. Same as Jonathan Penfield so far, looking to take it back cross court and lining up a second air in the same direction. Here we have the 360 that you were claiming before. He did it, cross court again making the best out of the terrain, never missing a feature. Getting really a sick little bit back so there. Far. Yeah, I've been watching uh, with my own eyes as the long lens to make sure I get a perspective on the face. And Victor, even from a distance, I can see how huge that air is. Stomping it perfectly, making his way down to the bottom band here. It's so steep coming to the section. Must be absolutely blind. It's a convex rollover. And he's looking at the highest part of this bottom section at the moment. Coming in with speed doubling down off it and making it look so easy from the Frenchman looking to win his first ever free-eyed world to a title and with a run like that and airs out the bottom turning not jumps into long airs I think we might be seeing a new free-eyed world to a champion here today yeah I would say and here we have his brother watching very closely the three-time free-eyed world to a champion just watched his brother become first time Freeride World Tour champion because there is no doubt that this is not last place. <laughs> Absolutely. Because <laughs> that's I will the only scenario. My hat yeah. If that is the last place run, that is unbelievable. He's wearing a golden bib. He'll get to keep that all summer through to next year. Look forward to welcoming you back. And big love right there between Zav and Victor Delarue. The former Freeride World Tour winner congratulating his younger brother, as we're saying, almost certainly the new Freeride World Tour winner 2019. Keeping it in the family. Phew, like as usual at the finals, there are so many emotions, so many stories coming to an end or a conclusion. And this is one of them. Huge 360 transfer of Victor Delarue holding his stuff together. Here we can see going over that lip and challenging conditions. You see the, the board ripping. It's really crusty in there. Not easy to ride. Finding beautiful trainees, landings. That's what, he, what he's known for. Yeah, just putting the landing gear down perfectly. I wonder if he'll be taking that hot seat off Jonathan Penfield's amazing run from Jonathan as well, but a 360 on air, there was a straight air for Jonathan from Victor. So is he going to take the top spot? Not quite. 82.33. Penfield was 85. Penfield was a little bit faster through that top section, maybe took those ears a little bit bigger, and in the end it is counted. Victor Delarue sitting second at the moment, already not last, so I believe that means he is a World Tour champion for 2019. Unofficial. Unofficial, but we know it's going to happen. Yeah, and he pointed out, we love you, Bichon. Unfortunately, sad days as well in the freeride community. But uh, things go on, and Victor Delarue just proved that the freeride spirit is fully alive, congratulating his competitor, Penfield, in the hot seat. Penfield, Delarue, Klaassen stacked top three already and it's only the first three riders that we've seen i'm pretty excited for the next one it's blake ham the rookie young 24 years of age out of us of a the rookie from last year i must say he proved to have deserved the spot on the freeride world tour really strong consistent riding playful approach to all of the venues what will he has have to offer for us today yeah i feel like he's really stepped it up this year 
Last year was his rookie year, as you said, getting into things, figuring out how it went. It was his first time on the Bec de Ross. And now really strong, consistent riding through the first four competitions. He was in the running for the Fred Will title, uh, not managing to put down a winning run in the last competition, which he would have needed to have a look into that. But he is battling up third and fourth with Sammy Lubke, and he is on course. Taking that first feature again, I must say, from start number three, it's a little lower down than what we've seen from Steve Klassen taking it from the all the way up from the peak. It is this further option that the Free World Tour competition organizers offered them, and he's also going for a huge 360, unfortunately not sticking it clean. Yeah, looking frustrated with himself there, Blake. Big front three, but uh, good to see the ambition happening, sending it big, putting the tricks in. Uh, not quite his run so far, but you've got to be putting down such a heavy hitting run to get a look into the podium. It's, it's that or, that or uh, go big or go home is what I'm trying to say here. And Blake's good at that. Sending that one deep as well. His backflip in Japan to start off the season, first right out of the gate was mind-blowing stuff. And it's great to have him here in Verbier. Sure, looking to have him back here again next year. If you have the chance, look at the, the board moving through the snow. You can see it's pretty crusty, really tough to ride. Not sinking in at all at this cliff drop at the bottom, at the landing. But he manages perfectly. Bumping up his score again. Of course, not a really high score to expect with the big trouble at this 360 at the top. But making the best out of it with a 180 at the bottom. Nice nose butter three as well. Blake Ham, really solid rider out of the USA, and that was a good run as well. We've just seen such a high level here today. Steve Klaassen, the legend, from the top down to Dog League Kulwa, and then sending runs from Henfield and Victor De La Rue. So in a normal day on the Big to Ross, I would say that would be up there, but with that control issue, like you said, I think that'll not give him a look in on the podium today, unfortunately. I was like, where is this? You're right. It was so good to see all of the boys pushing it. No safety runs here where things went wrong. Luckily, just a little wrong, so he managed to get his board under his feet again to shut down the speed because you don't want to get into a tumble on the back de Ross. You're not stopping for quite a while. Not at all. Judges liking the four categories other than control. <laughs> really liking his line. Control, fluidity, technique, and air and style. Sorry, not his control. It's uh, the only one in the red there, or in the orange. Uh, I think he'll still look at a reasonable score because of his strong riding, but uh, not going to challenge Penfield in the hot seat. So just below Steve Klaassen at the moment with that control issue, 54.33. Still a good run from Blake, impressive features, but won't get a look in on the podium today, as we were just saying. And that means we're already over halfway through our guys snowboarding. Who else is about to come? We have... Uh... Next up in the start gate, it is Davy Beard. So, Davey looking to take home a title on the Victor Ross today. Running really well this year. Super solid, stylish riding from the Alaskan. As I was saying, I've seen pretty much every stop, I think. I just love the way he tweaks his methods. So, probably unlikely or pretty much impossible that he could take home a World Tour title overall today. He'd have to win. And as we said, somehow for Victor to come last, which is obviously impossible with Victor sitting currently in podium contention. So Davey Beard and Sammy Lubke, the last two to run. Such good attitude from this guy, Davey oh, Beard. Oh, yeah. I hope that all of Homer, Alaska is up at late at night having a big party, watching the Verbi Extreme from home or from some bar and uh, cheering up their local Davey Beard dropping in now. That's right. It's been a pleasure to see him and his girlfriend, Lindsay, traveling together this year. They have all the fun and they do all the smiling. Davy Beard starting things off strongly, taking that transfer air to the side and pretty far as well. Looking at him with the long lens eyes of ours now. So I'm not going to be able to tell you if it's a 360 or not, but he's certainly taking that one deep. I just love watching his face from far away because you see how quickly they're moving between these massive features, how steep it is, oh, the exposure they're above. Nice grab in there, tweaking it out over that lip. Getting into a very steep zone, managing his slough, getting over the ledge with a huge backflip. Yeah, Davy Beard! <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, he just had an issue on the shutting down speed. 
couldn't tell. It was just some smoke in the air. But, but so oh. fast through that bottom section there. We saw Victor Dillero go through a little bit more slowly and Davey Baird backing himself to take it four line into the compulsory sniper landing in the shoot. Holy crap, Davey, blowing my mind. Is that one of the first backflips we've seen on the Victor Ross from a snowboarder since Cyril Neri? I'm not sure, but I'm super impressed. You might be right. Cyril Neri definitely was watching very precisely. He's uh, controlling all the drone footage here. He's a drone pilot by now. And uh, David Baird in a huge tradition, ripping it up back there, Ross, with a huge backy in the middle. Wasn't expecting that. Have a look. Going deep on that one. Yeah, nice mute grab. Aaron Style at the absolute maximum. Here comes the action. Back, he lays it out and stomps it like it's nothing. The after bang, like he's in the park. Davy Beard, unbelievable stuff. And then this one, look how much further he went in the last bomb hole. Just absolutely sending it today. <laughs> oh, yeah. He definitely went for it. He went to have a shot at the title. This is out of reach because uh, Victor Delarue already is down and had a great run. He's not last, so he, Davy Beard has no chance to win the world overall title. But it is the precious title of the Verbi Extreme. On the line. On I think the line. that will solidly put him in second overall, though. And today, how's he going to do? Currently third, looking at a podium just behind Victor Delarue and Jonathan Penfield on top. So with one rider left to go, Davy Beard could be taking a podium on the Victor Ross. But Jonathan Penfield, after saying he'd put down solid runs and not managed to get the, the placings he was hoping for in the first few competitions, could be looking at a Victor Ross title. Oh, yeah, it's looking good. It's looking good. There is, in fact, only one rider left to go, isn't that true? That's right. Sammy Loki won the last three editions of the Freeride World Tour Finals here in <laughs> Verbier, the Verbier Extreme. So is he going to do it? Can he win again? Can he win four in a row and be the only person to have ever done that in male snowboarding and probably all of the categories, I would guess. Yeah, and you know what? He had a role the last years, not only taking the finals win every year the last three years. No, he also took off the Freyard World Tour champion every year. And uh, in one, like it was two years ago, I think, where he had the maximum possible points at the end of the season. Just so impressive career of the Squaw Valley local, Sammy Lipke. That's right. And I take that back, actually. There is someone that has won four in a row on the Victor Ross. It is Ruth Leisbach out of Switzerland. So looking to be the first guy to do that on a snowboard, Sammy Lubke, father of two, shout out to his beautiful daughters, he made it home for their birthday after the last stop, and uh, it's great to see him shredding the professional snowboard circuit and being a great dad, and looking at the, those great grabs as well, he's just an all-round good guy, looking forward to seeing how fast he can shred this face, because he is on a heater right Are now, taking it off the nose! Whoa, this is such a steep section where he just hit one of the bigger cliffs in there. Wow, he makes it look so easy, man. That's the craziest thing. That's a massive air, and he just stomps it like it's nothing. After bangs, rides it out, lines up his next feature. He's so quick through these steep technical zones. I hope you know that there's exposure under every cliff. And spinning that one, oh my gosh, man, he looks at make. Oh, he looks at make. He makes it look so unbelievably effortless. This stylish rider out of Tahoe, Squaw Valley, California. Pointing it off the bottom one as well, just like Davy Beard did. I think taking it even further in the landing. Love it when people overshoot other people's bomb holes and Sammy Lubke is the king of that. Oh yeah, he always takes that extra speed and uh, has the cleanest of landings. What a stylish rider. Loves the slash turn in between the, the big features. So fun to watch. <laughs> Looks like he's having so much fun. That's why it's so fun to watch. Yeah. And Sammy Lukey back on form, not been quite at his uh, to a stop winning self for the last couple of stops. And I think that that run should put a massive smile on his face. Whether he's the winner or not, I would guess that's probably going to be on the podium, but I can't be sure because it's been such heavy hitting snowboarding today. <laughs> what a level again. What a level what? again. Like, I don't want to make any predictions on uh, scores because it's so hard to tell, but here we have one of a very unique feature. We haven't seen anyone taking that cliff, but then he went into the zone where we had quite a lot of traffic. We have seen already some 360s and backflips off there. Yeah, there putting was a nice indie grab in that three. I think he's the only guy to grab his three really well, so that could be a difference here today. Exactly. He, he uh, had another grab in there at the bottom cliff, so that could have made the difference. We'll see. 
big hug with Jonathan Penfield, his fellow countryman. Jonathan Penfield out of Tahoe, Sammy Lubke also out of Tahoe. Jonathan having made the move up to Canada, living in Whistler now. Sammy Lubke looking at his score. Where's it going to be? Is it going to be on the podium? Yes, it is. It's going to be second place behind Penfield in front of De La Rue. Takes home a podium for the fourth year in a row. Not quite the win that he was hoping to get, but what a way to round out the season for Sammy Lubke. <laughs> Absolutely. Of course, he is used to winning, so there will be a little bit of a twitch in his eyes saying, mm, that could have been just a little few points higher, but he will be super happy taking off. The second place podium, what a heavy hit a podium with Jonathan Penfield, Sammy Lipke and the champ of the Freeride World Tour 2019, Victor De La Rue. Holy Beck. <laughs> Jonathan Penfield, 85 points, Sammy Lipke, 83, just in front of Victor, 82. So the podium well above the rest of the riders. Davy Beard, even with a smooth run and a backflip, 76 points, Steve Klassen, 63, and Blake Ham, 54. So Gigi Roof will be joining us next year. Unfortunately, too ill to make this stop. We miss you. We're looking forward to having you back. But amazing riders from the guys snowboarding today. I still cannot really quite understand what just happened. Oh, yeah. Like... I have to say, Steve Klassen, he was the one standing out for me today, even though he uh, just finished up in fifth place. But he was the only one going from the very top, from the true back, I have to say. If you see um, the image of the back right here, um, you see the start number three is a little further down. Of course, still very intimidating place to start off. But... It's not the same as taking it off from the back top. Victor De La Rue, 9,180 points. He is the Freeride World Tour winner 2019. Following the footsteps of his older brother, we'll see if he can back it up with as many wins as Xavier claimed. Davy Baird, second overall. Great run from him today. And Blakeham, third overall. Sammy Lubke, the defending champ. He is in number four and Penfield, number five. So, shooting it down to the finish area for a winner's interview again. Ed Lee, what you got for us? Thank you, boys. What a competition that was. Third place on the day, Victor, but world champion in your rookie year. Congratulations. Thanks so much. Super stoked. Never expect that on coming here this year, especially after our first crash on the first competition. And then it all went pretty, pretty smooth and well. Zav talked about that to start with, didn't you? You said you weren't sure how he was going to adapt to competition. Yeah, I know. Like I saw him first in Japan. And then I was like, I was knowing, you know, how it feels to be up there and having to pull one perfect run all the time and being consistent the whole season. And, and I knew it would be difficult for him and I so didn't expect that he would handle it so well. Mm -hmm. and the, the thing that, that works for me, I mean, we can watch some of the replay of your run, but it feels like this kind of riding is part of the Delarue DNA at the moment. Well, he's Delarue DNA. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we go. We can see a little bit of this. The, the second cliff there, you sent that really deep. Yeah, I was really not sure about the snow. It was like, you know, in some places it's like 15 of good snow, of kind of sugar, but then in some places it's just bulletproof snow. So, you know, when you're on top, you know, you, you have to hit some, some pretty big ears. You're like, oh, am I going to land on powder or on concrete? So it's a bit of, of a mind fuck, I would say. Yeah. Um, uh, interesting choice of words. I'll apologize to anyone now. Yeah. <laughs> Apologies. I'm the French. Language um, barrier. Yeah. <laughs> what about the, uh, I mean, we, we talked about this at the beginning, but there's a lot of riders. It's a really difficult thing to do when you've got a really strong reputation as a film rider to put that on the line. You didn't need to kind of move away from frozen mind and the freestyle parts that you put down and, and put that reputation at risk on the free ride world tour. Did you feel pressure? Uh, it was not a problem about reputation, it was more about a matter of uh, adapting to competition, which was uh, super different for me. The first competition was super weird to wear a bib, to go to a uh, riders meeting, to do the whole thing, to be so to look at her face for much more time than we do when we are filming. And then uh, it's a whole different process, but I'm super stoked to learn it and uh, to learn something new this year. And there was a little bit of pressure to live up to your big brother. For sure, I had to. Ah, come on. I think we've all like we've had different careers, different paths. And that's what's cool about Victor. He's come from freestyle, so he's always had kind of his own way. And I think that's what's so cool about him because he did not have to try to just copy what I did, but he he just brought his own style and then you can see it here. It's like completely different from me. Yeah. Gentlemen, Victor, Thank congratulations. You. Thank you so much. We're going to take a quick break now, but when we come back, we're going to get stuck into the ski men. 12 of the world's best going toe-to-toe -to -toe on the biggest face in competitive free riding. We'll see you in a second.
Welcome back to the grand final of the Freeride World Tour. This is the Extreme Verbier. If you're just joining us, we've already seen the women's world champion crowned. We've seen the skiers and snowboarders in the women's. And we've just seen the snowboard world champion crowned, Xavier Delarue's younger brother, Victor. And now it is time for the skiing. Uh, Lorraine, Zav, we've seen a lot of different conditions experienced by all of the skiers. How do you think the snow is going to affect what we see from the male skiers now? Well, uh, is my mic working? Yeah. 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 Well, to be honest, I think it's gonna be, um, yeah, it's gonna be like a game where people are gonna have to be really smart. Uh, there's a lot at, st at stake. I think Marcus is really uh, in good position to win the title. But I think now with the skiers, there's just no choice. They just send such big lines, and the level grows up every year. And we've seen this year things going down, which like you'd not expect ever to see. And I'm sure they, they will do the same here because they're insane. They're so strong. And there's, there's a lot of pressure on Marcus. I think there is a lot of pressure on Marcus. He's never won a title before. He's, um, yeah, I think it's a head game with him. I, I, obviously, he has amazing skills, amazing talent uh, in a lot of different areas. And we'll just see how he deals with that pressure. Hopefully, he can stick with his skiing, focus on what he needs to do. And um, yeah, regarding the conditions, we could see that it's crusty in places, but not everywhere. So that's what we call variable conditions. So sometimes it's actually a nice turn, you've got powder, you feel confident, and then all of a sudden you'll have a crustier turn, which can catch you off guard. That's not easy to deal with at all. We saw that with Hedvig Vessel yes. earlier on yeah. in the women's skiing. Okay, we're gonna take a look back and how the ski season has panned out for the men. Uh, it's been an absolute barnstormer for Marcus Ida. Like I've been so consistent up until now and everyone thinks and tells me, oh, you're going to win, you're going to win, you're going to win, you're going to take the title home and blah, blah, blah. But there is still a chance to not to. Managing to land on his feet because he's a cat and a huge, huge one there. transfer here. Straight into the same one as Craig with the cork three safety. Boom, Marcus. Oh, oh, oh Marcus Eater. And from last year for him so far, taking that top one big and sending it straight to the pocket. He's so good at lining up that transition. Technique is on point. Being on the podium and even winning in Verbier would be a really big thing for me. So that's, that's my goal. Double across the pad. Yes, he is. What a sick move. No one else saw that. No one else has done that. Transfer air that takes you straight down to the next cliff. And a court three off that one, grabbing it out. I didn't know this guy was such a freestyler as well. Oh, yeah. Oh! Okay, welcome back. Now it is time to get things underway. The talking is finished. The ski men are up at the top and waiting to drop in. Let's hand you over to our commentators, Neil Willeman and Martin McFly-Winkler. Thank you, Ed, and sorry for calling you Ed Waite before. I know your name is Ed Lee, but shout out to Ed Waite anyway. Here we are at the Beck from the top. The ski men are dropping in soon. And the ranking we have coming into it, as you were just saying, Marcus Eda sitting at the top there with quite a lot of points in between him and Christopher Tudell, but not guaranteed to win overall. Yeah, you have to know that Marcus is way more nervous than you would expect when this scenario is like he has to finish last, that Christopher Tudell actually has a chance with a win to take over the title. Not far behind them though, Leo Slamet and Andrew Pollard. Quite contrasting riders there, Leo Slamet, former Free World Tour champion, coming back from injury. Andrew Pollard looking just the same as Victor Delarue, not great in the first competition, and then storming back with multiple podiums to show that he deserves to be here. And that was really cool to see. Tom Pfeiffer, Tom Pfeiffer as well out of Canada. Unfortunately, his twin brother Liam not joining us here today. But uh, Craig Murray uh, sitting six after only doing two competitions, crashing in the third and breaking his foot. So that's pretty impressive from the Kiwi. Oh yeah, there will be so much more to see from him in the future. I can tell you that and you know even better because it's a really good friend of yours. Hope Ta he will be back next year, but the action of today is going to kick off with uh, Vade Gorak, the uh, rookie. This year had a really uh, tough start into the season, but then uh, with his 
stand or signature backflips, he made his way back and into the finals of the Verbi Extreme. That's right. Mikel Bimbo is last year's Verbi Extreme winner. Christopher Turdell, last year's overall champion. Uh, jumping through things here, Leo Slim at the 2017 for World Tour winner looking to retain his title. Drew Tabke won it in 2013. I'm out of Viro, the crazy sender out of Spain. Tanner Hall and Craig Murray not starting today, unfortunately. Tanner back in the film game in America and Craig with a broken foot from the crash in uh, and uh, fever run, I believe. So uh, shout out to those that cannot join us this year due to injury. There's so many here that I, so many that can't be here that I'm not sure if I can name them all. But uh, I want to give a shout out to Craig for giving a shout out to Hank for at the first stop in uh, Hank Billis out of New Zealand, not able to start the tour due to hospitalisation. And uh, he stood in start gate and said, "This one's for you, Hank." So this one's for you, Craig. For you, for Hank, for Ivan Melikov, for Sam Lee, for all the people that can't join us here today. Maud Bess, uh, we've got a. Also out with the injury, the, the super local Jan Rassis. But first up on course, starting it off today, only three stops after missing the first one from injury. It's Vadik Gorak. He was competing on the qualifiers since 2012, I believe. And now he is back. First time on the World Tour, first time on the Beck. And he is here to rip it up with so much speed coming out of the gate. Oh, yeah. Central Kuluar, super steep terrain. First Making time ever way. on the back doors. Already into Hollywood Cliff. Opening things up with a huge air. Yeah, buddy. Con continuing to riding super strong. Huge turns. Getting into a new zone there. Or for him, definitely new zone. What we will see of the huge cliff at the bottom. A huge backflip. Sick. <laughs> Holy damn. Are you kidding me? That it, Gorek, what a way to open things up. That was a mind-bending run from the Frenchman. Uh, he last competed against him in Romania in 2013, and it was such an experience. He backflipped two cliffs that everyone else was too scared to hit. Six years later, fast forward to the Bec de Ross. He got here by throwing a huge backflip at the last competition in Andorra, and now he's throwing a huge backflip out the bottom of the Bec de Ross after ripping the main cool out of shreds. What a way to show that you deserve to be here on the Freeride World Tour. Vadik Gorek, take a bow. Take a bow. Wow. <laughs> like... There was no sign of hesitation, not even a splinter of hesitation was in there. Like the speed he carried through all the way was insane on his first ever try attempt on the Bec de Ross. Skiing like a veteran, I must say. Absolutely, there's been a lot of talk about the variable snow and the, the potential for that to catch riders out and this absolute no fall zone, which is so steep with big landings and takeoffs, but not only kick, keeping the speed under control, throwing a huge backflip straight to his feet, landing bolts, as Derek Foos would say, almost blowing his toes off with that landing. Unbelievable stuff from the French rookie. <laughs> he must be pleased. Oh, yeah. 92 <laughs> points. Holy oh! crap, that was insane, and he is stoked. He has worked towards this for so many years, so many years of fighting his way through the qualifiers, finally making it qualifying last year, only just making it after an amazing run in Andorra. First time he gets to ski the back, just like his fellow Frenchman, Mikael Bimbos. He is back, and he is on form, and he has 92 points as the first rider out of the wow. gate. That's also very like uh, a lot of respect for the judges that they... Uh, have the guts to get the score already on the first rider. They know they have another eight scores to fill in between or the 100 points, but next rider, who can challenge Ga <laughs> Vadek uh, Gorek. I keep calling him Gorek Vadek. I think yeah. I saw him as that on the start list once, and I always got confused. But his countryman, Mikel Bimbo, is the winner of last year's VBA Extreme, is about to drop in. Do you think we'll see a similar line from here today? Yeah, he's a, he's a very similar type rider than uh, Gorek, and uh, he also has the backflip in his bag of tricks, and especially the high-speed riding, no, like, no hesitation at all. The highest speed is, did he just put some snow down the back of his neck before he dropped in there? Like, bit hot, needed to cool off. Probably also taking that top air, you have to know that this already is mind-blowing stuff with Oh, this exposure so underneath fast. you. Are you fucking oh kidding me? Oh my god, that was crazy. One turn into the Hollywood cliff. He's going unbelievably clear. <laughs> I'm losing my words, man. That was he straight lined the whole big after that. Mikel Bumos, what are you doing? 
<laughs> Are you kidding me? My brain is melting, man. I can't even talk anymore. He was so fast. How many turns did he do? Look at the bump hole of Hollywood. He's clearing it nearly double the size of Hollywood. Oh my God, that was unbelievable. How fast do you think he was going? He posted something to show that he was doing 130 kilometers per hour in his run in the FIFA run stop. He must have been going even faster. I think he did about three turns down the entire <laughs> Victor Ross. Mikel Bimbos, you are exploding my brain. Look at that line. <laughs> And you have to know that that's kind of actually his turns that we see here. It's not only the line. Or oh, his lack of turns. <laughs> yeah, lack of turns. Holy Although, damn. Uh, have a look. There where it starts because it's happening everything really quick. This Cannot is so steep. steep and here, just like racing down. This angle does not justice of the, of the height. Not at all. Come and see this with your own eyes, people, because that is unbelievable. Watching that firsthand, I couldn't understand how he could go that fast and keep it under control. <laughs> he's giving a point at the score, but I think he's just seen that his countryman got 92 points. Vedic Gorek sitting in the hot seat right now, and he's not quite going to challenge that. 84 points. Still pretty damn good score from the Frenchman, the defending champ from this competition. He's got a message for us. Oh, man. What a dude, what a dude. Mikkel Bimbo's last year killing it at two events, taking home the win at two events last year, including the Verbi Extreme. Unfortunately, not this year. Here we have Christopher Turdel next up in the start gate, and we have something to say about this rider. Yeah, Christopher Turdel, the defending World Tour champion, and as we have had lots of chat about just now, if he wins today, he could take home the World Tour title again. So he has everything to ski for. Uh, Marcus Dieter kind of has everything to lose, and I don't really like that statement because he's not going to lose. He's not a loser. It's just that the pressure is kind of more on Marcus because, uh, you know, Christopher's behind him. He's got the lead in the sights. He knows he needs to do everything, take home the win today, and then he can take home the title. And I almost feel like it's an easier position in some ways, yeah. mentally. Easier, but I'm uh, pretty sure I talked to them yesterday. They're um, uh, Christopher, he's not really yep. talking about or thinking about the title. He wants to win here, and he wants to have his good friend Marcus Eder do well here too. So uh, Christopher has his mind to win at the Verbi Extreme, and uh, everything else would be a bonus. That's right, the camaraderie is strong here. And I loved his run in Andorra coming off a heater and so fast through this top section as well. I must say, my favorite rider to watch, always in control, unbelievable style. Look at that feature. He's just making it look so easy as usual. I say it all the time, but it's true. And what a hit here again. Sniper landing into the super zone and taking that one so <laughs> deep as well. Christopher Turdell, unbelievable stuff here. That air in the middle absolutely blew my mind because you had to be on exactly the right angle and it is absolutely blind from up there. You <laughs> cannot see what angle you need to take from the top. You have to have some kind of landmark at the bottom. He'll be looking at uh, the tent or some people or some kind of other rocks or the slough line to make sure he lands exactly in that pocket. Did it perfectly. And as you say, and I've said before, he just makes it look too easy sometimes. You're right. Like, this is everything on the absolute humanly possible limit to execute. And he just makes it look as if it's a walk in the park. Unbelievable stuff. Do you think it can challenge this guy, Vedic Gorek, sitting in the hot seat at the moment? Do you think Christopher Turdell has a shot at that? He didn't have a trick, which Vedic did, but he was so smooth into that technical zone in the middle, something I don't think other people usually do or may, maybe even will do today because it's, yeah. it's a mind bender. It's pretty scary. So I think he has a shot, but there has been Vedic's backflip at the bottom, which is such a technical and such beautifully executed uh, version of this cliff. Um, they had, in fact, a very, very similar line, if not the exact same line. This part, I would say, he even took it deeper and more control. Like, there is no better way of executing this. But here, he got a little bit out of uh, his line, I think. He would have wanted to take it a little higher up, but he made the best out of it. So it could be that this made the difference, his backflip at the bottom of this... Uh, of his run. Yeah, amazing stuff. <laughs> i just like to emphasize that these two guys have ridden so well, and it was unbelievable that Mikel Bimbo's went even faster. So 87 points for Christopher Turdell, sitting about four or five points behind the current leader, Vadik Gorek, and it is going to be hard to knock him out of the hot seat. Uh, Mikel Bimbo's didn't do as many cliffs, and even though he skied faster and went bigger on the Hollywood, that's why he is not currently sitting at the top. 
And if a well-executed line of Christopher Turdell doesn't kick you off your hot seat, then nothing can. That's right. Interview with Christopher Turdell now at the finish line. What's he got to say? Christopher, uh, really, really fast lines. The level seems to have gone through the roof this year. Yeah, you know, I really wanted to do a big mountain line, ski as fast as I could. Uh, so it, it felt fast. You must, have, you, you must have been looking down on uh, Mikhail and Vardek's lines. You could see the, the condition of the snow there, and it looked like they were really traveling. Yeah, it was a bit tricky today. Like, Definitely not the best snow, a little bit catchy, but I guess all of us still made it our way down, so super happy. It doesn't look like anyone's compromised any lines or drops yet. No, you know, this is the grand finale. It's all in. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, Christopher Tudel there saying that the snow was a bit catchy. Didn't look like it the way those guys were skiing, but I absolutely believe them. They were just out there on a mission today to show the world what they've got. Wonder what they could do if the snow was not catchy and even better. You're right, and another guy that uh, can handle tricky conditions like no other is uh, the mayor of Stomptown, age 36, the veteran out of Åre, Sweden, and he proved three times already with uh, taking the win three times at the back de Ross. And even more impressive in my eyes is that he already has three seconds on the side on on his bank account. Yeah, so uh, and he's the one of the yeah he is. The one who could take and equalize uh, the all-time Aurélien Ducrot with four wins here at the Back de Ross. That's definitely his goal for today. René Barcared. That's right. Three wins, three seconds, tied with his countryman Kai Zacherson for three wins on the Back de Ross as well. So looking to make it four equal, for, uh, as you said, Aurélien Ducrot today. Suits him so well, this venue. And I think that... He just keeps now putting on super consistent lines here, and the levels just got higher. Other people have got better. He has not got worse. Look at him fly down this thing. As usual, full in control. He knows what he's doing. He has been riding this line before. Beautiful Straight off the Hollywood. Over Hollywood cliff. Reina Bakaria just making it look so simple down here. Sending that one into the, the sniper landing that you've got to hit. Taking, taking this one huge. deep. Go just past the last bomb hole. Yeah, you're yeah, right. <laughs> snap. <laughs> oh, man. Rain is sorry to not be more emotional because we've seen just already three lines, similar execution, and you just followed their tracks perfectly. You kind of set the tones for so many years and pushed the boundaries, and that's your own fault. You have some competitors that just do the same now. It's unbelievable level. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. You know, a few wins a few years ago, that would have pretty much well, been a guaranteed win. It's so sick. fast, so controlled, it's so big. And just like you say, he changed the game, and now that the game has been changed, there's other people doing what he has been doing for a while. So, uh, incredible run, but I'm not sure if it's enough to take the top, top seat off uh, Vadek Gorek. You're right, like, it's it's so frustrating, actually, to comment on it, on it because it's such a high High level of competition, such a high level run, and then you're like, but it might not even be on the podium. That's crazy. Yeah, it's unbelievable. All the judging criteria in the green, so good chance of jumping on the podium. Don't have that many skiers in the guys today due to injury and absence due to other commitments, but Rainer Bakari is certainly putting in a strong bid to podium again here today. Do you know if he has any thirds on the back as well as all the first and seconds? <laughs> yeah, like with uh, six, six scores, first or second. I'm Sorry, not sure whatever. I think he... Did he? Did he have a crash? I'm not so sure. Okay. <laughs> I just can't imagine him doing it. Yeah, I can, me, me too. I cannot remember. Or I have a really good crash of him. 2009 in Sochi. Yeah. Out of the start gate. Yeah, yeah. He put that on Jerry of the day, I think, actually. <laughs> yeah. Hey, but big love to Rainer's dad, currently in hospital. Rainer missing out on the Andorra competition because of that, going back to Sweden to hang out with his family. All the best to him and his family. Rainer Bakaria, thank you for the show today. You're currently sitting at 86 points. Oh, yes! Nice. Sitting on the podium at the moment, just behind your countryman, Christopher Tudel, and, of course, Vedic Gorik in the hot seat. So could be looking at a podium. Got another few amazing skiers yet to come. Getting a hug from his wife there, Jackie Passo. Oh, yeah. Reini Barkered, always such a pleasure to watch him for so many years. You have to know that he started 2009 on this venue. And someone who just started this year on the biggest uh, platform of free riding is Andrew Pollard out of Utah, the 24 year old with his sister on tour. 
very successful siblings, Andrew Pollard, in his rookie year. Yeah, that's right. Shared the podium with his sister twice in a row, I think, in the same position as well. Uh, third in Andorra and a second in Fibaron. So can he podium again here to make it three in a row? Would be impressive stuff. It's a really heavy-hitting field. First time on the back. Could be looking at Rookie of the Year in the male ski category. He's out of the gate. Andrew Pollard out of US of A. So the first skier to start from the lookers right start where most of the snowboarders started from and doing a similar line so far to the podium snowboarders and really, really fast too. Holy damn. Charging down here. Beautiful transfer over the lip, a 360. Charging down over the ramp, taking a deep straight air. Going another transfer. He loves those hits. Yeah, really cool transfer there. Super creative run so far. Turning it back into the fall line to make sure he gets as many features as possible. Similar to the snowboarder so far, but a little bit bigger, a little bit faster. Which is, it's just crazy to compare it to the other skier guys that have skied in the central cool one. This could be a podium or a winning run in any other competition. But given how hard the other guys just sent it, I think that this might not be up there. I don't know. See what the judges think about the more freestyle-centric lookers right version of the back. But yeah, right. pretty, hard to, pretty hard to compare to it. You know, oh, yeah. What it. A, still very clean, <laughs> solid. He ticked all the boxes with a freestyle trick in there big mountain features and even uh, a little side note he actually hit the last oh, cliff which was he connected with the line of his sister who oh, had a really yeah, strong too. performance too so <laughs> yeah cool. yeah they have kind of a, a bond going beyond being sisters and brothers i Love guess his style though there really cool grab tweaking it out spinning this one kind of reminiscent of the ryan fire 360 a couple years ago here shout out to him taking this one straight into the fall line. So super solid skiing, as we were saying, but the level is just so unbelievably high today. Whoa, 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 yeah. It's, uh, it's not just a name, it's or just an expression. It's the best riders in the world competing today on the Bec de Ross. And that's why you are in fifth place if you're not killing it all the way down. I mean, Still. he did kill it all the yeah, way down. Sorry, You're sorry, not killing it I, even harder. Yeah. It's so tough, man. And that's a good example for me. Ryan Fire a few years ago did that massive three, huge backflip and a big cliff on the Beck de Ross podium. And I think it was as a rookie and then didn't requalify for next year. So you've got to be on point all the time. And this guy has been. Karl Regner Eriksson out of Sweden. Yes, he's kind of on his rookie year. He was uh, coming on tour last year, but because of injury, he had to pull out and uh, come back this year. So first full year on tour. Carl Renje out of Sweden, young rider, very hopeful for the Swedish countryman to uh, go, yeah, step into the big footprints yeah. of Rene Barkadet or Kay Sackerson and so on. Christopher Tudel, Svade Lilliquist, the Swedish legends that have dominated this face, which is super impressive because there aren't that many super high long faces in Sweden, but somehow they seem to be really good at it. Very smooth rider, good friend of uh, Christopher Tordell and Rainy Barker. And uh, usually they take very similar lines, no coincidence. They talk about their experiences. And can he take advantage of the experience of his fellow countrymen? So fast through here again. Carl battling through the qualifiers, and as you said, breaking both his arms, not being able to make it to the competition last year. But starting things off, be the first person to hit the Gilles Varel cliff down here, coming unstuck though, and turning it into a tumble. I really hope he's going to be okay coming off this next cliff. Oof, yeah. Big, big crash off Carl. Fortunately, he landed in snow again. He's back on his feet. Left and the he's ski waving above his the hands. Cliff, that so is the, uh, the sign that a rider is okay. Really glad that he is okay as well. That crusty snow that Christopher Turdell probably uh, was, oh, that Christopher Turdell was mentioning, probably catching him out. And his skis are quite a long way above him, going for quite a tomahawk off that next cliff. I'm really glad he seems to be okay, waving his arms, giving us a signal that he is all right. And really impressive to get a ski dude there so quickly as well, already collecting his skis. It's gnarly terrain in there. You got a pretty be a pretty good rider just even access the area you're yeah, right we have uh, the best of the best mountain guides and ski dudes here on the back because as you said just accessing the lines of the riders is already super challenging yeah skiing -wise. look at him standing on top of a gnarly piece of exposure just to get the ski of carl so thank you to the ski ninjas and all of the safety staff taking a wee drop with skis in his hands there so big ups to the safety crew we've got doctors on site we've got heli lifts if we need them we've got lots of safety team in place, whatever Ooh. happens. So, you just had your binoculars out, McFly, having a look at Carly. Seems to be doing all right. 
Yes, he is. Uh, uh, he's uh, pro probably not, no, just probably, but very sure, very shaken up. Taking huge tomahawks. Probably uh, a free fall over 10 meters into snow, luckily into snow. Yeah. But uh, that was a huge washing machine. Yeah, glad you're all right, Carl. I bet you're shaking and stirred right now. Let's hope that all his bones and ligaments are all right. He's getting his skis put down next to him. Such a hopeful rider for the future. Looks like he's got his poles as well. He's giving a thumbs up from the ski dude that seems to be saying that we do not need medical assistance. So glad to see that. A uh, big shout out to Carl and his brother Ole. Ole and Carl Regnier fighting their way through the qualifiers over the last couple of years. Really, uh, really even. I think they've just been in front of each other or behind each other. We was on the right or wrong side of the cut line to get through from the tough free outward qualifier circuit where only three guys make it from Eurasia and three guys make it from the Americas. So Ole here in Sweden, uh, sorry, in, uh, in Verbier as well, representing from Sweden. He is not competing here today. He is watching his brother. I wonder if he'll manage to make it through the qualifiers in the next couple of years and join his brother on the Freeride World Tour because he certainly deserves it. Both amazing skiers and uh, long-time competitors at the Scandinavian Big Mountain Championships and Rex Granson. A little bit nicer conditions here maybe than their, their motto on the 20th year anniversary of skiing in flat light for 20 years. So at least we have a beautiful sunshiny day in Verbier here today. On the Victor Ross, it is in the shade because it is north facing. That's why it holds the snow so nicely and doesn't get too sun affected as we're watching Carl get his skis on and hopefully make his way down to the bottom soon. Yeah, so we had actually our first scare of the day, which is already super impressive to see so little crashes or control issues. They're riding on the highest level what is possible and still having most of it in control. Here, unfortunately, we had a display of a loss of control after the Gilles Vauriol cliff, huge air into probably a very crusty snow landing, which was uh, probably very tricky to shut down speed. And if you look at the tracks, we, we can see with our bare eyes from uh, probably five, 600 meters away, we can see the cut of the skis in this crust. Yeah, which I think it's it a little bit of sun tunnel. maybe, just a little bit of a different aspect, a little bit eastern, uh, getting tiny bit of sun at some point in the day, which makes it given it a crust, as you're um, saying. Here, no. Out of my experience, I was riding underneath once in one year as a forerunner, and uh, there is always a slough channel going straight through Gil Boriol, and very often, in often years, you don't even have a chance to ride it because of too many rips and uh, too funky channels okay. from the slough, so that could have been the issue. Yeah, so Carl Regne Eriksson made it to the finish line, maybe not in the best state, getting a bit of attention there from Scandinavian compatriot. Hedwig Vessel seems to make <coughs> have made it down to the bottom in enough of good shape to, to ski down and uh, maybe see a doctor later in the day. But glad he's all right to the extent that he can make his way down himself, having a bit of a sit down in the finish. Cool. He will get a zero point score. It's a no score because he, he lost the ski. But first, let's see who we got in the start gate now. Let's catch our breath again because none other than the leader with the golden bib Already a legend skier of our sport, Marcus Eda in the start gate, about to drop in. And I have to say, he's already third World Tour champion because we have his only competitor who could kick him off the top podium on the overall standing has not finished in first. So, Marcus, this is kind of your victory lap. That's right. I think he probably knows that as well. Christopher Turdell currently sitting in second, almost taking the win home today, or the potential win, meaning that Marcus, as you say, is already free out will to a champion. So sending it deep off that first hit, skiing the same line as Andrew Pollard so far, the snowboard popular line. 360 of that transfer, a little sit back, huge speed coming out of it. And coming into a completely different zone now. We haven't seen anyone come through here. It's cutting back towards the main face from that other start further look is right. And getting creative with the transfer airs with a massive flip. <laughs> yeah, Marcus, that was unbelievable. Jesus claiming it, hands on his head. I bet he is stoked right now, just like after last year when he knows about a three. He's now done another creative, amazing freestyle inspired line. Looking at the Freeride World Tour Champion 2019, Marcus Eder. Taking the Freeride World Tour Champion title with style. Holy moly. <laughs> a yeah. <com> <laughs> a complete new line. We haven't seen that air ever, 
before. All I of cannot, the love. I can't say of from watching the, the Freeride World Tour and the Extreme for, is it 13, 14 years now? So, hands up for this guy, Freeride World Tour Champion 2019 out of Italy, Marcus Macke. Eder. Marcus Eder out of the Dolomites, out of South Tyrol. Are we going to see two Freehard Wheel Tour champions from South Tyrol crowned here today? I believe we are, the Italian representatives and guys and girls skiing. Marcus Eder, I don't think there's any way he can't take home the Freehard Wheel Tour title today. And what a way to do it. 360 on top. Or was it a shifty? Shifty. Uh, sorry. Oh, super sorry. sick shifty, though. Yeah, but yeah. I'm glad you got it mixed up like I did last time. <laughs> yeah. Here, a little bit wheelied out, but not too bad. And here comes the huge back. He stumped. Perfect. He changed his angle in the air as well. That's amazing. Yeah. How can you shift your angle? Look at that. Look at that. Congratulations. Who was that from? Was that, yeah, Victor Delarue in the back down. His, his good friend he has been traveling and filming with this season. Also the Freehard World Tour champion. What score are we going to have for Marcus today? Not starting from the central cool bar start. Starting from the ridge start that was popular with the snowboarders. And a tough one for the judges. Tough one for the judges where to place him in this highly stacked category of uh, ski men. So hard to compare different lines because, you know, the, a lot of the other guys were skiing that central couloir and it was kind of easy to say, oh, you went faster, you went bigger, you did a trick. And Marcus completely changing it up, skiing a totally different line that, like you said, I haven't seen before. You said maybe not ever. It was at a whole new year. Yeah, like I've, in my mem memory, of 24 years of uh, very big stream, I've seen at least 14, 15 of them. Here we have his score coming in fifth with 82.66, but he has huge celebrations to do because that golden bib is his. Yeah, congratulations, Marcus Eder, your 2019 Freeride World Tour champion. He super deserves it. Congrats. Let's hear from the finish line an interview with Freeride World Tour champion Marcus Eder. Ed Lee, what's you got to say about it? Your, your season this year has been defined by original lines and you just laid down another one here at the extreme. Yeah. Yeah, I actually, I actually uh, didn't want to do it because I didn't thought it, it'd go, it went. But then I sat from the top and I changed my mind. And I was just feeling this one way more than the other one I wanted to do. <laughs> people were just, I heard people whooping and hollering watching the replays because you actually managed to change the angle of your landing in that backflip. It was phenomenal. I don't know. I just, just a backflip, man. <laughs> <laughs> a, a truly incredible line and it caps an amazing season for you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Not many words and all of the emotion to sum up how he feels about that. I think that there's been a lot of chat about how he was probably super nervous coming to the potential winning of the Freehard World Tour, and now he's got the relief. He doesn't know what to say about it. Oh, yeah, there are a lot of emotions of this guy going through his body right now. A few tears to shed, but action is not finished on the Bec de Ross yet. We have another rookie coming in hot, standing in Stargate number two above the central couloir. And this is some of the most gnarly terrain that's just below the rookie Tom Pfeiffer out of Canada. That's right. Tom caught up with him briefly yesterday, asked him how he felt. He said he didn't know how to feel. He'd never skied a venue like this before, so he'd decide once he's up there. I'm sure he's feeling pretty nervous now, but cool to see him in the start gate at the finals here. Tom Pfeiffer out of Canada, out of the Whistler Free Ride Club, getting things started off with a bang. Whoa, 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 whoa. This is... Oh, yo, yo, this is such a gnarly cliff up there. Yeah, and he thought he was going to that look his right zone yeah. <laughs> of a possible Gnar. Can make his way to the Hollywood cliff now. Going big on Hollywood. Yeah, taking a Keep good angle. Keep your off stuff that. together. That's not the way the spot you want to fall. <laughs> no, nervous now after watching Carl's crash. Yes, exactly. But Tom, another rookie on the Big De Ross, making fast work of it. Creative, smooth, and taking this one super deep. Going for a double. Cool double. What a first line Ooh. on the Big De Ross. Tom Pfeiffer, congratulations, taking a podium in his first competition of the season, standing on the podium with Marcus Eder and Tanner Hall in Japan. Could he be looking at a podium here today? I'm not sure. A lot of people ski that line similar, but maybe a little bit faster, maybe a little bit bigger, but whatever, man. As a rookie on the Bechtel Wass, <laughs> the Bechtel Wass, way to send it. Tom Pfeiffer out of Canada. Take a bow. That must be so oh, scary yeah. in the crusty snow. Chapeau, chapeau. Tom Pfeiffer with a line on his first ever attempt on the Bec de Ross, which is uh, up there with all the greats of our sport. 
only 21 years old, the same age as Jacqueline Pollard. So two of the youngest rookies we have on the Victor Ross. Showing they've got what it takes. Little bit backseat on that landing, which wise control scorers are the only one that's not way up in the positives, but super strong skiing from the young Canadians. Show what he's got, why he's going to be back here next year. Hopefully back on the back as well, but definitely in the World Tour 2020. I think we that can see from him a little bit how the very, snow was crusty. Very smart riding actually at the bottom cliff because we had already three people going in there with uh, Vadek doing the backflip, so <laughs> there were some bomb holes and you oh don't want to land like, in this crusty oh, snow in bomb holes. Oh so very smart riding of the rookie, getting the cheer of uh, his fellow compatriot, Andrew Pollard. Tom Pfeiffer with the score was 71.66. So just behind Andrew Pollard, his almost compatriot, his North American ah, compatriot. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. He's Canada. Yeah, sorry but for that. great run from the rookie. And now the not so rookie anymore. I used to think of him as a rookie when he came on the World Tour and then didn't requalify, requalified, and then won. That's Leo Slemet out of France. Whoa, Leo Slemet. He is always good for a huge line at the back there, Ross. What a career he has on his hands. Dominating the juniors, getting into the qualifiers, straight qualification on the tour, dropped off the tour, came back, and then won the Freud World Tour title in 2017, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. What yeah. a legend already with 25 years of age. That's right. Yeah, I think that Verbier is an extremely emotional place for him. His, uh, his girlfriend passing away, uh, the former Freud World Tour champion. And big love to him and big love to her about that. The Verbier local passing away here in Avalanche a few years ago, not in a competition. But uh, Leo Slim, I'm sure, doing this one for her. For her. Ride for Estelle. Exactly. On her mind. And he is going into a new zone. Huge cliff just below him. No hesitation. Going huge. Holy damn, Leo. No one else has gone there today. Sending so much love over that cliff. Spinning a three into the exposed zone over here. Really solid run here so far. He's taking a second here before on the big oh, draw, looking you're for attempting a win. For a huge buttress there. Going for a backy. Oh, oh sticking it. Oh, Leo. <laughs> and not finished yet. Ooh. Cutting back into the mandatory and stomping that one too. And still not finished, probably. He knows how to please the judges all the way to the finish. Yeah, this one rolls over. It's so blind, but still no problem for oh. Leo sealing it. What a line from the Frenchman, yeah. the Chamonix. Seems a good amount of uh, creative stuff over there from him and Marcus Eder today. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yeah, you yeah. were saying. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, man. Only able to make the second three stops, not the first one in Japan, missing out in Japan during to injury. Winning the last stop in Andorra, qualifying for the Freyard World Tour Finals here and putting himself oh. in contention for another podium. Might be hard though, starting that look his right side. We haven't seen the top scores come out of there. And just, if you're new to our sport, just have a look at the camaraderie. They are all heavy competitors. They are competing against each other, but they are all big hugs and cheering up each other for good lines. That top clip, oh. holy crap. And this backflip as well. It's Dude. not a very poppy takeoff and just floats it so confident. There's an exposure as well. I don't think you can see that from these shots, that every landing here is a no-fall zone. And so much backing of himself from Leo Slam at the 2017 Freud World Tour champ. Oh, he is pleased with that for sure. But unfortunately, we had already so many good lines that it might not end up in very first place, but he is in second, second place. <laughs> Leo Slimmett, what a way to finish off your season. You won the last stop. You're sitting in contention for a podium here. What a way to come storming back into the Freyard World Tour after injury kept you out of the first stop in Japan. Said your ankle was troubling you through a massive double backflip in Sham just before you came back to the next stop and podium central after that. He must be frothing his face off right now. Huge congratulations. Leo Slimmett proving to be one of the best again. So, an interview with the Leo Slimmett in the finish line, Ed Waite. What does he have to say about it? Leo, an incredible line. The landing on the backflip looked like it might have been a touch flat, though. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was good. <laughs> <laughs> That's an understatement. And I don't know. It was, the conditions are not that deep, and I had to, to find the control after it. So, I lost some point in that part, but I'm pretty happy about the run because I did. 
I did exactly what I was looking for. And yeah, like three com, three, let's see with the other guys, but I'm happy. It feels like the level has stepped up in so many different directions here today. Uh, yourself and Marcus taking the more freestyle lines and then Rene, Christopher, Mikael and Vardek all taking those big mountain lines. Uh, actually, I'm in between. I think a lot of people were waiting for me on the start in the central. Then I, uh, no, I like to push myself in different steps. So, like, so, having fun is the most important, damn it. You look like you had that. Thank you. Thank you. Good words. Good words from Leo Slimit. Having fun is the most important thing. Also, pretty much what Arish Komi said. I like to hear that. And one man who has uh, figured out the definition of fun and while skiing is the man to come, Drew Tapke, the veteran out of US of A, one of my favorite riders to watch ever since he came on tour 2008, you have to know. He came on tour where, as a rookie from the US of A and uh, he was killing it ever since. Impressing of us especially for creative and playful runs with transfers out of heaven. Yeah, exactly. The transferinator, Drew Tabke, winning the Fred Wood Tour in 2013. So many former champions <laughs> competing here today. It's an unbelievably heavy hitting field. And also starting from that looker's right start, coming over to, is it going to be the same line as Leo Slimmer? It seems like he's getting, ooh, there's a little bit of hesitation. Is he going into something super gnarly or was there... Checking out the Gnar zone. Oh, yeah, yeah. As usual, he's going into zones where no tracks have been before. Even though he's second, second last rider of the competition today. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's stepping up. Such not an original skier. But I'm not course. sure if this is exactly where he's hoping to go. Maybe it is. I'm not sure. We'll find out in a second. Of course, he knows that this is not scoring well. That's not about what the competition rules say of flow and fluidity but he is putting on a show on into a zone where no one has been before i can tell you that ever drew tavke super new line and airing down off here Woohoo! stomping that one perfect with a lot of slough yeah it looks so good for the dom, photos right dom Dyer and jeremy will love it with the photos and lenses on drew tavke right now making his way down to the looker's right part of the face. Suspect that he probably got lost up in that top section. That was not what he meant to do. Usually such creative line, a line finder, finding the lines that no one else can find, but sometimes maybe giving the best of them, and I think it might have happened on this occasion. Going off the biggest nose there. Nice cruise down of Drew Tapke. He has nothing to prove anymore. He has done it all, seen it all. Yeah, we know he's a super solid rider. Not his strongest run today, but uh, glad that he didn't try and jump off something that he didn't know what was underneath. Maybe things look different to what he was expecting when he first got into that zone up there. As we saw a lot in the pre-show, a lot of times things look completely from, from, from the top than you expect when you scope from the bottom. And Drew Tabke, usually a master of that, but maybe not quite working out the way he expected on this occasion. All right. Just uh, we're waiting for Drew's line score. Here we have the re replay of his uh, top air. Beautiful line, no lines in, in there before. Fluidity down during the, due to the side stepping he had to do to get over across to that zone. All of the other bars in the green though, showing a strong skiing. So Drew Tabke. Looking for a score now, it is a 50-61, just behind uh, Tom Pfeiffer, 10 points behind Tom Pfeiffer. So Drew Tabke sitting in ninth place at the moment. He's qualified for next year. Oh, He'll yeah. Be back. I hope he will be such a lovely guy to be around with and such an ambassador for the sport. <laughs> Come back, Drew. But next and final rider of the Verbi Extreme here is the Spaniard, Aymar Navarro. That's right. The fireman out of Valderam, the almost local in Andorra, like showing us around there and showing us a good time. He's always got a smile on his face. Great sense of humor. Lovely guy. Incredible skier. One of the Snowmads crew. Been in the Snowmads truck all the way to Greece when they had that huge winter a couple of years ago. So he's been lots of places. He's done lots of amazing things. Films the incredible South Lines productions down in yeah. South America as well. If I would describe him in one sentence, he is... Uh, 
exploring to the max. Exploring. If it's a, if it's a third World Cup competition, he's always coming up with new lines, exploring new takeoffs, and also with his uh, ooh, going big already at Whoa. the central couloir. So fast. High speed. Coming down to the dual Varal cliff. I've only seen Carl Regnier has seen it, seen it so far today, and he did not manage to stomp. So can Imanavara do it? Yes, he can. Coming high speed out of there, taking a different angle to Carl off that, which might have been the key to land in a different slough run, as you were talking about before. They were scoping together yesterday. They might have uh, shared one of two insights there. Super fast through that section, going over the last huge cliff, landing in the bomb hole and oh, clipping a no. ski there. Unfortunately, oh, just right into the bomb hole yeah, of the I'm other so riders. Sad to see that, man. Everyone else. Got the chance to land on a fresh landing, and he almost cleared the bomb hole as well. It was super close. I thought he'd made it over it. Must have clipped it with just one foot, maybe, but that can absolutely buck you and send you into a tumbling fall, like happened to Samuel Antimanen on his face a few years ago. Not having as much of a long tom tomahawk as Samuel Antimanen did a few years ago, but seems to be all right. Got someone collecting his skis. I think his poles are still a little bit further up there, but I'm Navarro. Thanks for putting on a show. Best wishes, and I hope that everything's all right. Yeah, let's hope he, his knee, which had a couple of beatings over the last years, is all good. That he can come up with another series of South Lines in the summer. He's going down to South America, pretty sure again. Kind of his second home, I would say, where he is exploring lines after lines. I'm Anavaro. He is already qualified for the Freeride World Tour for next year, for 2020. He'll be back, looking forward to it. Interested to see this now, how does he land? Yeah, he clips that bomb hole with one foot and just sends him into a tumbling fall. Not too far away from those rocks, so I'm glad it was not over them or through them. Skiing down to the finish line now, glad to see that he's okay. Yeah, that's what these athletes are training for all season long, not only to have the, the thighs and the muscles to resist the pressure of riding, but actually also to take those beatings. Yeah, that's right. I'm out of our little muscle nugget. <laughs> He's absolutely stacked. The Spanish rider not having the best day today. Looking forward to having you back next year. Love the way that you scope and send lines. I wonder what music he had on today. Yeah, maybe some uh, Quentin, Tier Quentin Tarantino soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. So I'm uh, just in the finish line at the moment. There'll be a no score during to losing his skis. If you lose a ski or unstrap your snowboard for any reason, you receive a zero score. So he'll be sitting in last today. Vadik Gorik winning the Freeride oh. World Tour Finals here. Big ups to him. Leo Slim at second. Christopher Turdell third. Rainer Barkery at fourth. Just missing out on another podium for him. Mikael Bimbo's fifth. Andrew, sorry, Marcus Eder sixth. And the Freeride World Tour champion crowned Marcus Eder on the Bechter Ross this year. Andrew Pollard seventh. Tom Pfeiffer eighth. And then I believe it was... Just with the crash, then Carl Regner, Eriksson, and uh, Ayman Navarro rounding out the bottom. Drew Tabke yeah. as well, uh, getting a little bit lost, but staying on his feet. Tanner Hall and Craig Murray not competing today. What a show we had on our hands today. Unbelievable stuff. I just, yeah, I have to repeat myself. Every year they are pushing it, and they're pushing it to the next level, even in very tricky conditions. Of course, uh, they make it look so easy where you think, oh, yeah, the, the snow must be great, but it's not. No, no, like, that's the thing. Like These lines only just started getting done a couple of years ago, and now the snow is not that good, and they're still doing those lines. Yeah. They can't emphasize the difficulty of that. Can't emphasize it enough. And what atmosphere. You just saw the finishing corral of the, the <laughs> public area, and they were cheering up those riders, and they can... Here we have the overall ranking of the Frail World to 2019. Marcus, Marcus Eder, Eder out of Italy. Maki made it. Well deserved. Congratulations. Christopher Turdell, last year's World Tour champ. Leo Slim at the year before that's World Tour champ. Andrew Pollard must be the rookie of the year. Vedek Gorek coming strong into the Freeride World Tour after a couple of years on the qualifiers. Six or seven years, I believe. Tom Pye for first time on the bet. Congrats to him. And uh, Craig Murray still in seventh, even though he only did two and a half competitions. Mikel Bimbo sitting in eighth at the moment. Qualified for next year. He had two wins last year, but this year behind Craig Murray. Looking forward to seeing what he's got for us next year after pretty much straight lining the bottom half of the deck that was so fast must have been the fastest runner today 
maybe one of the fastest runs I've been on the back that I've seen. Ever. Oakley White Definitely Island. ever. Like, uh, Mikael Bimbo is just absolutely yeah. blew our minds. Yeah, amazing stuff. So great crowd here today. Great show. Bluebirds, guys. I'm pretty stoked. I hope you are at home as well. From myself, Neil Willerman, and my co-commentator, Martin McFly-Winkler, goodbye. We're sending you back down to the finish area for another interview with Ed Lee. Not Ed Waite, another celebrity from Britain. But thanks for having us, guys. Thank Glad you. Glad you enjoyed the show. And thank you from my side. It was a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, thank you for having us <laughs> on the show at least. Uh, Peace out. Have a good uh, season and be safe. Ciao. See you next year. Thank you, boys. Excellent job from McFly and Neil in the commentary box. Time to take a little bit of a breath and just try and absorb what we've just seen. Vardek uh, Gorek is here with us, and we've got the world champion, Marcus Ida, as well. What an incredible set of lines. Vardek, I mean, first win on the tour here in Verbier. That, that's just ridiculous. Well, I don't know what it is now, but... I just want to ride with my spirit and go fast and make a big backflip. Is that today for me? I win, I don't release. Uh, it's not possible for me, but I will see after. And I'm really happy for Victor Dolery, world champion, and my friend Marcus. Just a beautiful day for me and for every people, I think. I, uh, the backflip, undoubtedly the highlight of the day, just not because of the size of the cliff, but also the speed and how clean the landing was. It was breathtaking. Ah, this moment I don't have a choice. Uh, full speed and okay, okay, okay. No, no, no choice, uh, no reflex. Just take back flip and after we'll see. And it's okay for me now. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, that, that was just the beginning as well. The momentum that created with Mikel Bimbo's line and then Turdell's line and Rene's line. It was, it was an incredible 10 minutes of sport. Every people did an amazing run. I, I sit in the hot seat. I don't understand why I stay here, but <laughs> everybody, oh shit, oh shit, it's a... Uh, Beautiful show for me too, but it's amazing. I don't know. out of the gate, first time on the back with a huge backflip after sending the cliffs above it as well. So we're going to see a replay of his run, I believe. Vadik Gorik sitting pretty in the hot seat all day and now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with a, what do, you, do you get a golden bib for winning the World Tour? I feel like you should get something. The World Tour finals, I mean. You get you that big it? rock or something? Yeah, you get a huge rock off the back there, us, which is a huge uh, accumulation of rocks, the back there, us, and uh, you get one piece of it as your trophy. And that's... Yeah. The rookie, can you imagine? The huge Just imagine pile of like rock. being <laughs> the first time ever on the Bec de Ross and then killing it with such a line. Wow, just yeah. uh, my uh, chapeau. So I think what we're going to see next is the line of uh, our current Freeride World Tour champion 2009, very freshly crowned. Just having a couple of problems technically at the moment with the finish area. So here we have Marcus Eder's highlight of his run with a 360 transfer just above and then this huge backy transfer. As you said, he was uh, shifting his, uh, his line of uh, trajectory mid-air, which is so impressive to do and that's... Here we he have uh, all his friends. Subconsciously as well, because they mm -hmm. didn't, uh, when they asked him about it in the finish line, he didn't really know what they're talking about, but he took off to the backflip, he came around, saw the landing, adjusted his angle so when he landed, he wasn't skiing straight off another cliff. He did do another smaller air off that, but he went a little bit further skiers left of it to not go into uncharted <laughs> territory. So unbelievable cat like reflexes from yeah. the Marquietta. Especially from the uh, angle that we see. Uh, it looked like he's aiming for this other cliff. Exactly. And you're right, I was also like holding my breath. <laughs> yeah. Imagine. Yeah. But, uh, I've been yeah. He's watching uh, things with my long, long lens eyes today, and <laughs> yeah. that, that gave me some scary moments as well as <laughs> yeah. some missed called 360s. But 
unbelievable stuff from every single competitor today. Oh, and as you mentioned before, please, boys and girls out on the screens, if you ever have a chance to come to Verbier for the finals, please do, because this is just a completely different perception of uh, the Back to the show here, if you see the whole venue and the exposure underneath. So, four World Tour Champions crowned here today. Marianne Erti, the first one winning the women's snowboarding. She had already actually won coming into this competition and said that she wanted to throw down the run of her life, and she did just that, that today. The only snowboarder in the women's to start from the looker's right start and doing it with such style. Here we have kind of a best of of her season. A few different uh, angles, uh, POVs and long lenses from... Uh, uh, previous editions, not editions, contests, but that was the final feature of this year's Free Art World to Extreme finals. <laughs> yeah, so many hugs from the athletes today. It's just emotions are running high after a couple of days of looking at the face and stressing about what you're going to do, whether it's going to work out. It's not just a question of uh, whether you're going to land your line. It's the, the competition points, the overall standings, being nervous the whole time. Oh, and yeah. it was cool to see hugs between the ski woman and the snowboard woman as well. It's really yeah, camaraderie it's all atmosphere. It's a big family. Yeah. The ski woman as well, claiming a world title today, Ariana Tricomi, backing up her win last year with another win this year. Coming second today, but a great season so oh, far. Oh, yeah. She's taking two Fred World Tour wins in a row with uh, what a season. 360s. Uh, Freestyle moves, smooth riding, big mountain riding. She ticked all the boxes of what free riding is spectacular for. And uh, what a run of for her today. Yeah, me saying good season so far. You know, she won the world tour and she <laughs> came second on the back. <laughs> yeah. So far to the end, she's done quite well. <laughs> really liked her, her quote as well at the bottom. Skiing is the biggest love of my life. Uh, sorry, Sven, I hope you don't get jealous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's a pretty lovely guy as well. The oh, speaker. yeah, the water couple. They are a hard-charging couple from living in Innsbruck. That's right. Snowboard men as well. Victor Delarue taking home the title today. Impressive stuff from him riding the Beck for the first time. The first time in competition, anyway. In front of the eyes of his older brother, Xavier Delarue, the 10-year-old younger brother, had a stunning season, opening things up with a crash, although here in... Uh, uh, Japan, but then he opened up the throttle with his classic butter threes at the end of some amazing runs. Had amazing score coming into uh, this year's final with nearly already taking it in the last event in Andorra, but he had to prove that he is capable of winning or riding strong on the back That's to right. become Free World Tour champion, which he just did. Congratulations, Victor. And I missed call that I said that Sammy Lubke was the only guy to grab nicely in his 360 today, but that was not true. <laughs> Victor <laughs> Delarue putting in some amazing grabs in his freestyle maneuvers. And last category. <sighs> yeah, obviously, I must say, always the most spectacular. The speed they are going, the ski man category is just always through the roof. So fast. It was unbelievable <laughs> coming down the central Kulwa today, especially since the snow was a bit yeah. uh, chalky, unpredictable. You know, it was a bit crusty in some areas, caught out Carl Regner, Ericsson, and Ayman Ovaro, but not many crashes for a place that had uh, unusual snow. And here we have a little recap of Marcus Eder, the Fred World Tour Champion 2019, freshly crowned. Uh, what a season for him, starting off with a win in uh, Japan, another great result in uh, Canada, and then... Uh, Another win in uh, Austria, Fieberbrunn, cementing right. his World every Tour run. champion title. <laughs> yeah, what a way to do it. Oh, yeah. Looking at well, the Well, well deserved. Here. Proves it in all film and road trip projects. And now he's also officially the third World Tour champion. So two out of Italy, two out of South Tyrol. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Italy going strong into free ride. Yeah. Yeah, that's oh, right. Yeah. Really impressive to see that uh, the out of slope style and backcountry freestyle backgrounds, you know, Ari was saying that when she went back to Innsbruck between his two stops that she mainly skied uh, a fun skiing. She went skiing with the crew. The snow wasn't exactly what they're looking for for freeride, so they just made the most of it and had fun with what they had, which I think is a real spirit of freeride. It is, it is. And then I'm such honored to uh, be part of this family and uh, experiencing it firsthand that the elite class is still living up to that free ride spirit, free ride spirit that we started it with. Uh, so good to see.
Yeah, that's right. So junior competition also going down here today. A little bit further look is left of the competition face on the back that you have been watching on the screen with us. So look at the impressive images. Sorry to interrupt. Have you seen the, the finish area? Here you see the finished corral first of the juniors, and that's the finished corral of the elite class. And the Audi um, viewing area as well. Yeah. Got about four different villages set up on the mountain here today. Super impressive stuff. Big up to Verbier for putting it on, and all the sponsors for having us. Uh, Audi, Verbier, Vale, Lottery Roman, Peak Performance, Alpina Watches, Black Diamond, and Peeps. Big shout out to them. Vibram, Crosscool, Sun God, Dynastar Lang, White Frontier, they've got a new beer out for us today. Rico, GoPro, and Ista. Many more to go on with. Have a look at the website to check them all out. Unfortunately, we cannot go back to the finish area. The sound has been lost somehow. Uh, I'm glad that we managed to get all the great imagery and interviews out of there today that we did manage to have and real emotion coming through there. I loved the way that everyone mobbed Marcus when he came down from his <laughs> yeah. run there. That was so cool to see. A accumulation of hands and hugs and uh, everyone, uh, yeah, giving him the chair that he deserves. What a day. Let's see some highlights and then it's going to be time to say goodbye.